Uh, so hello everyone and welcome to the 2021 NIH Behavioral and Social Sciences Research Festival. Each year the NIH Behavioral and Social Science Research Coordinating Committee uh, with representatives from every NIH Institute Center and Office holds this festival to highlight some of the exciting and impactful recent research that the NIH funds in the behavioral and social sciences. For our welcome and opening remarks today, um, I want to introduce Jim Anderson. He's the NIH Deputy Director for Program Coordination, Planning, and Strategic Initiative. Jim, it only took me seven years to be able to say that off the tip of my tongue easily. Uh, Deepa Kipsey is the administrative home of OBSSR, um, and uh, we're one of the 14 offices that are under his charge. Um, I'll just mention that although Jim's scientific background is not in the behavioral and social scientists, sciences, he's actually an internal medicine hepatologist um, with expertise in things I don't understand, like tight junctions and paracellular transport. Um, he's been a strong supporter of the behavioral and social sciences at the NIH. So it's my pleasure to welcome Jim to provide welcome and opening remarks. Jim? Yeah, thank you, Bill. And let me uh, add my welcome to this annual NIH Behavioral Social Science Research Festival. As Bill said, this is a two-day event that's organized by OBSSR and in collaboration with our NIH-wide Behavioral and Social Science Research Coordinating Committee that has representatives from all of our institutes and centers. And again, as he said, the main goal of the meeting is to highlight the latest behavioral social science research funded by the NIH and this is important in its overall impact and importance across the entire field of biomedical research. So I'm going to repeat that theme, the importance of behavioral social science research across the entire field of biomedical research. Now, this is sort of obvious to most of us. Uh, the mission of NIH is to prevent and treat diseases of people. To be successful in achieving this mission, people's health must be considered in the context of human behavior and social interactions, not as modeling people as behaviorally and socially inert black boxes. A really unfortunate example recently is the still ongoing uh, importance of considering behavioral social science uh, in our response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So developing a vaccine is one thing, but having it accepted by individuals and communities is quite another and takes a different research approach. So beyond us scientists, uh, Congress also recognizes this connection. And in the report language that accompanies the 2021 appropriations bill from the House of Representatives, NIH was given this direction from Congress. And I'm going to quote, the committee believes that a more robust and focused NIH commitment to behavioral science research and training would yield significant improvement in the nation's health due to the important connections between behavior and health. Most of the leading public health issues facing our nation, including cancer, addiction, heart disease, mental illness, diabetes, violence, and AIDS, are rooted in individual and social behaviors. And then they went on, the committee directs the NIH director to convene a special advisory panel of behavioral scientists and other community experts to complete an assessment providing recommendations on how to better integrate and realize the benefits to overall health from behavioral research at NIH. So this review is ongoing um, and we hope it will provide recommendations on how to apply the lessons and methods of behavioral and social science research to research across all of NIH to more effectively improve health. So that's about the theme today. I also must recognize with quite mixed feelings that the OBSSR director, who's also our NIH Associate Director for Behavioral Social Science Research, Bill Riley, will re retire at the end of December. Uh, fortunately, Dr. Christine Hunter, who is our current Deputy Director for the office, will be stepping in as the Acting Director. Bill has really done an outstanding job for the last seven years in helping set the NIH-wide research priorities uh, and in being a go-to person and a face of behavioral social science research to all of our stakeholders. I wanna thank you, Bill, and wish you all the best in whatever comes next. Finally, I wanna thank everybody who helped plan the meeting. It looks great. Uh, and also this year's keynote speaker, Dr. Shannon Zenk, 
the director of the National Institutes of Nursing Health here at NIH. So thank you, everybody. Hope we have a productive, it looks like a fascinating meeting. And back to you, Bill. Thank you, Jim. Thanks so much for that. Um, all right. So um, as is our uh, typical behavior in these annual um, festivals, um, I'm going to kick us off with a state of the behavioral and social science research at the NIH um, for fiscal year 2021, which ended on September the 30th of this year. Uh, so next slide. So I'm going to start with the NIH funding overall for behavioral and social sciences research. Next slide. So here you can see the um, amount of funding uh, for behavioral and social science research um, that goes on at the NIH each year um, from FY17 through FY21. Um, I'll note, because most of you are aware of the RCDC categorical spending um, process, but just so we're all clear about what this means, um, what we're essentially saying with each of these numbers along the way is that of the grants funded that have a behavioral and social science component, right? Not necessarily fully behavioral and social science, but enough of a behavioral and social science component that they would be counted and included in the RCDC criteria for behavioral and social science research. This is the amount of grant funding that's provided um, to them over the years. And as you can see, um, across the years, um, we've continued to experience a significant increase um, in the amount of behavioral and social science research funding um, each year. Um, and that's been really good to see. Um, and that's also reflected in the proportion of basic behavioral and social science research, um, which has also continued to increase um, each year over the last few years. So there's been a, a nice increase in this. And I, I will say that in some cases, the um, compared to the increases in NIH funding overall, we are at least at up to speed, and in some cases, actually um, moving at a faster pace than NIH overall is in terms of funding by year. So we've seen some nice increases here, and it's been really nice to see um, the support for the behavioral and social science research um, efforts at the NIH over the years. So next slide. This is a number of uh, just new uh, behavioral and social science research grants funded by ICs in 2021. So. As you can see, um, nearly 5,000 grants um, in the behavioral and social sciences funded this year as new projects um, in 2021. You can see the breakdown by institutes and centers. Um, some of them are not surprising as some of the sort of larger ones. They're both larger ICs and they have a larger proportion of behavioral and social science research within their mission, NIA, NIMH, NIDA, NINDS, NICHD, et cetera. But the, the other point I wanna make with this slide is that there are social and behavioral science efforts and research grants being funded across the entire range of uh, NIH institutes and centers, um, even among some of the smaller centers and ones that you might not normally expect to have behavioral and social science research support. And as I noted at the beginning, our coordinating committee has a representative from every single one of these institutes and centers um, and allows us to um, coordinate these activities um, better and ensure that all the institutes and centers are aware of each other's work. And especially that some of the institutes and centers with smaller behavioral and social science research portfolios are able to take advantage and, and leverage the both resources and the expertise of some of the larger ICs in this area. So next slide. So a, a few years back, um, we wanted to drill down more than just say, okay, so this is the amount of behavioral and social science research, but be more specific about what are some of the specific content areas. So we did a, a, a natural language um, processing sort of modeling here of different content of the grants um, and came up with 13 sort of subcategories or subcontent areas of the behavioral and social sciences. It allows us to sort of track um, these specific areas in a little more depth. And so you can kind of see briefly what each of those are and in some of the categories that they're in. And these, of course, are not mutually exclusive either. Um, so there could be research that's in sensation and perception and also in attention learning and memory and addictive behaviors, et cetera. So a single grant can count under more than one of these, but it allows us to track content areas and sort of how the overall content of the research that the 
uh, NIH funds kind of flows from area to area. Next slide. Um, so this is sort of breakdown of the uh, number of grants, um, uh, new BSSR grants by content area in 2021. And it has been the case for a, a number of years of attention, learning, and memory uh, tends to be one of the stronger areas of research funding here at the NIH. But almost in contrast, if you think about this from more laboratory-based work to more field-based work, there's also a lot of research being funded in social processes and social determinants of health, as well as healthcare and disease management and other areas. And you can see as you go down that list, sort of what we tend to fund more of or less of along the way. And I'll just note, and I'll talk about this more later, um, near, the, near the end of this chart are sleep and sexual behaviors, which another Council of Councils working group on the basic behavioral and social science research efforts at the NIH noted as areas that we could actually work on increasing the amount of funding for uh, moving forward. So I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Next slide. So I wanna briefly talk about OBSSR and who we are and the co-funding, especially for those of you in the audience who may not know our office well. Um, and in actuality, we, we try not to be an office that you necessarily have to know well. Um, you get funding from the, if you're a research investigator, you get funding from the institutes and centers, um, not from us, um, but we help support some of that research um, and help coordinate that research across the ICs. So next slide. So our mission um, is threefold to enhance the impact of health-related behavioral and social sciences research, to coordinate that research um, and also integrate it more within the larger NIH research enterprise, which is part of what uh, Jim was alluding to earlier and I'll spend a little bit of time later in this um, presentation on some of those integration related activities. And then of course, to communicate um, the health related behavioral and social science research findings, to various stakeholders, both within the NIH and within, and within other government agencies and also outside of the federal government. And this particular festival each year is sort of one of the many ways in which we try to do that. Next slide. Our strategic plan has been in place for the last five years um, with three sort of scientific priorities that we consider to be particularly critical. Um, this uh, basic to apply translational area of, of trying to improve the ability of the basic behavioral and social sciences to be applied and um, translated into more applied research and intervention research moving forward so we can develop sort of new interventional strategies um, for behavior change. In methods, measures, and data infrastructures, um, and then finally in the translation at the other end of that translational spectrum, which is from applied research into adoption, um, implementation, dissemination, those sorts of things. As well as some foundational processes that we use throughout all of these efforts to keep the trains running on time. Next slide. So just to give you a sense of our co-funding activities, um, we're an office so you know that right now has a budget of total budget of about $29 million. Um, and as you can see from this, most of that funding goes out in the form of co-funding of grants um, to the ICs um, for behavioral and social science research. So a little over 23 a million of that 29 million um, in FY21. And that's increased substantially over the years as well. It partly reflects the fact that our funding has increased to some degree over the past few years, but it mostly reflects the fact that um, especially during COVID and opioid crisis and other sort of public health crises that have come along in the last few years, we've worked hard as an office to be efficient in all of the non-research funding efforts that we do so that we can put as much money as possible into uh, supplementing research funding um, for some of these key activities moving forward. Next slide. Um, so here's sort of a grant funding by institute and center. So you get a sense of this. And again, you'll, you'll notice there's not a lot of difference between the overall funding of the NIH and behavioral and social science research and what we co-fund by institute and center. Um, those are pretty comparable, but we do try to use our co-funding in part to make sure, especially that some of the smaller institutes and centers are ones with a relatively small behavioral and social science research footprint, or we're able to sort of expand that work and increase their ability to fund um, mission relevant behavioral and social sciences research with them. Next slide. Um, and then breakdown by content area. Again, as you'll note, 
um, a lot of similarity to the overall NIH mission as well. Um, so we partly track this also so that we can kind of make sure that we're not shifting too much into areas that um, we don't do a lot of research in generally, that we're, we're sort of trying to stay reasonably aligned with the overall sort of interest at the NIH and the behavioral and social sciences. That gives you some sense of how those break down over the, the groups. Okay, next slide. Um, so I wanna um, spend a little time on the active funding announcements and some highlights with that. I will tell you that this is one area of the state of the science presentation over the years that I have struggled with because um, I, there's so much that I could tell you about. Um, and in the early, the first few of these that we did in the research festival, I actually tried among the three or four or 5,000 research, new research grants that we funded to go through them and highlight a few that we funded that I thought were particularly interesting. Um, it, it's obviously difficult to pick six or eight or 10 to highlight among thousands of new grants that we fund every year. Um, so that became a little difficult. And, and I will admit in some ways, almost a little pedantic. So after a while, it's sort of, here's yet another grant that we funded and this is what it did, et cetera, et cetera. So in the last couple of years, we focused a little bit more on um, at least sort of talking a little bit more about the, the uh, FOAs, the funding opportunity announcements um, that the um, NIH has put out in FY21, just to give you a sense of the sort of things that the NIH has been interested in and that will be funded come down, coming down the pike along the way. So next slide. So um, again, these are just the RFAs for behavioral and social science research in 2021. And again, these are selected highlights. These are not all. Um, so it, it, I, I sometimes have to chuckle when people say, you know, NIH doesn't really do any more RFAs anymore. Um, I couldn't get all the RFAs in the behavioral and social sciences on a single slide. Um, and again, these are just sort of highlights of a few of them. But I think it gives you a sense of the breadth of research um, and the focus of behavioral and social science research within the NIH. Um, it includes sort of social drivers of mental illness in low and middle income countries, ethical implications in the advancement of neurotechnology and brain science out of the brain initiative. Um, our colleagues at NIA, everything from aging research in animals at one end of the spectrum to data enhancements and analyses to clarify the relationship between education and cognitive function at the other. Uh, NIDA on mechanistic studies on the impact of social inequality on the substance use trajectory. Um, one of the other things that NIDA has been sort of the lead in, though it's a trans NIH initiative, has been the Healthy Brain and Child Development Study, which we recently got underway and is sort of a extension uh, downward in age from the uh, Adolescent Behavior and Cognitive Development Study that they've also led over the years. So this will allow us to follow a longitudinal cohort um, long-term um, and, and look at both behavioral and developmental and brain and cognitive function changes over the course of time. Um, work on improving health disparities in alcohol health services, um, the impact of technology and digital media on child and adolescent development. Of course, learning disabilities as part of what NICHC does as well, addressing social determinants of health to eliminate oral health disparities um, from our friends at NIDCR. Um, in the dental and craniofacial research area. Uh, implementation science for cancer control and people living with HIV. Um, innovative multi-level approaches and strategies to prevent, test, and treat HIV in primary care settings. Um, both pilot and feasibility studies to improve technology adoption and reduce health disparities in type 1 diabetes. The RADx UP initiative, which I'll speak a little bit more about in the future, but a, a few um, um, RFAs that came out in FY21 related to that. And then at OBSSR itself, um, we release short courses on innovative methodologies and approaches in the behavioral and social sciences, which is a FOA that allows us to do some of the summer training institutes that we help fund um, for uh, junior level researchers. Next slide. Um, this is just the PARs. I won't even get into NOCES. And, and again, this is just a very small select set, but I think it gives you some sense Again, of the breadth of, of research that the NIH is interested in um, and some of the initiatives that maybe they didn't include set aside funds, but they were targeted enough that we felt we needed to have a specific uh, receipt and referral and review process for. 
Um, and that includes interventions for stigma reduction in HIV, biopsychosocial factors and social connectedness and health, um, which is part of the OpNet effort. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Time sensitive obesity policy and program evaluation, sustainable evidence based mental health practices in low resource settings, um, school based health centers to advance health equity, uh, dyadic and interpersonal processes and biopsychosocial outcomes, another OpNet effort. The role of work in health disparities in the NIH, one of the NIMHD um, PARs. Uh, computational approaches for validating dimensional constructs of relevance to psychopathology. Um, NCCIH's multi site feasibility clinical trials for mind body interventions. Um, I'll talk a bit more later about social behavioral and economic research on COVID 19. Um, mechanism focused research to promote adherence, effectiveness trials for post acute interventions to optimize long term outcomes. Um, development of psychosocial, therapeutic, and prevention interventions for mental disorders. Music and health, which is part of the Sound Health effort, uh, that's a trans NIH initiative. Uh, the NIC DCD's low risk clinical trials and communication disorders. And a lot of those low risk trials fall in sort of the behavioral classification. And then uh, addressing health disparities among immigrant populations through effective interventions. So you can just get a sense of the range of research that the NIH has been interested in and sufficiently interested in and feeling like we needed to encourage research in these areas, both from the RFAs and the PARs that have come out in the last year. So next slide. So I want to talk a bit more about NIH-wide BSSR initiative highlights, and uh, I'll touch on a couple of them um, that have been obviously um, at the forefront of some of the uh, more public health and societal concerns of the country in the last few years. Um, but there are a number that I'll sort of mention as well that are broader than that. So next slide. Um, so on the social, um, behavioral, and economic impacts of COVID-19, this is a, one of the cross-cutting initiatives that was initiated soon after the, um, the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and it was an effort to uh, look at the effects of various mitigation strategies on reducing transmission and the role of adherence to those strategies, as well as the social and economic impacts of those mitigation efforts. And the downstream impacts both of the pandemic and the virus itself, as well as of the mitigation efforts at, on mental health and suicide and substance abuse violence and other aspects, um, as well as healthcare access um, and health outcomes, particularly in chronic diseases, um, and how to ameliorate that with a combination of both uh, telehealth related interventions and community-based interventions. So it's been a large scale effort. Uh, next slide, and a wide effort. So despite not getting, we the NIH was really fortunate to get a large bolus of um, supplemental emergency funding from Congress, both for vaccinations and for testing. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. And though the NIH, including NIH leadership, tried valiantly to get more supplemental specific funding for social and behavioral and economic COVID accomplishments, we weren't able to do that, but between the, the gracious sort of provision of additional funds from the OD to support this, as well as from various ICs who saw the benefit of doing this, um, we had a sizable amount of money that we used um, across um, a number of institutes and centers uh, to fund a number of social, behavioral, and economic COVID initiatives. So you see some of the accomplishments there. The intervention um, component of this, a work group, um, has both digital health and community health intervention, both uh, NOCES for supplemental funding initially, and the PAR that went out that's funded a number of studies, um, R01s and others in digital health and community interventions, as well as 24 supplements that have been funded to date. And the data science um, work group um, also funded a number of supplements from existing cohort studies that were supplementing their work to include a better understanding of how their cohort was impacted by COVID and the social, behavioral, and economic implications of that. Um, and that included um, also developing and recently publishing and getting um, funding out for a population data science consortium that just began in September of uh, this year, last year, as well as rapid research on COVID and economic health impacts, um, working with the National Bureau of Economic Research and also with the IHME um, looking at uh, conducting county level disparities research. So I tried to cast a wide net to look a little bit better and support research that would help us better understand the social, behavioral, and economic implications 
of COVID, especially for um, underserved um, and vulnerable populations. So next slide. Um, one of the other things that we did um, early in the pandemic was to stand up a survey item repository. We realized that there wasn't enough time to come up with consensus measures for all the various phenomena that we wanted to study under COVID. So we thought the next best thing to that would be to allow researchers and give them a platform to be able to share the new survey items they were developing and fielding so that they would then be able to have others use those same items for data comparison, data merging, data integration, et cetera. And so that now exists, has over a hundred surveys in it and now exists in two places on the disaster research response um, website and on the Phoenix Toolkit website so that people who are doing COVID related research, instead of uh, recreating the wheel again and again and again, can look at these sites to see what other people have already done um, and what their survey items look like and borrow from those as well, including some surveys for nationally representative samples, which allows them to be able to link and weight uh, their data better to nationally representative work. So next slide. Um, one of the, and this is for me during my time at the NIH, is the largest effort that has involved um, social behavioral and economic sciences. So like I said, we did get emergency supplemental funding from Congress for testing efforts, and it included a range of things. But the one I want to focus on that I think is most relevant to this group is RADx up for RADx in underserved populations. So next slide. Um, so for those of you who don't know, um, the goal of this was to really look closely at COVID-19 testing among underserved and vulnerable populations in the United States, not so much on the testing mechanisms, RADx Tech and other efforts like that were focused on the testing platforms themselves and how to validate them and how to extend them and make them easier to use and make them more readily available. The job here for RADx Up was having those testing platforms available. What do we need to do from a social behavioral perspective to be able to um, increase the uptake of that, of that testing um, effort to be able to have people use them readily, to be able to understand what the testing means when they test positive versus negative, do they adhere to the subsequent quarantine behaviors, et cetera. So a lot of questions that we had about that. And this has been over the course of time, a nearly $500 million effort of the NIH um, that's funded um, 80 some um, projects to date. Uh, so next slide. Just to give you a quick sense, this is from the RADx up site of the breadth of the RADx initiative and consortium. If you look at a map of the phase one and phase two projects, they cover nearly every state in the country in terms of where the samples are coming from. And you can see where um, all of the institutions are um, across the United States. Um, and we've always worked hard at the NIH to make sure we don't have a just East Coast and West Coast only institution uh, representation. And I think that was well done with the RADx up group. Um, as well as you can see the community served, trying to focus on uh, some of the health disparate populations in the country, Hispanics and African Americans, both older adults and children, American Indians, et cetera. And then the settings in which these projects occur in um, help to address some of the vulnerable populations, um, school-based work, urban and rural, um, and in-home sort of testing efforts, and including things like nursing homes and prisons as well. So trying to provide a, a large diverse set of studies to understand testing uptake on adherence and follow up consequences um, to testing behavior. Uh, next slide. And then the last thing that, um, not the last, but one of many um, actually that we did um, related to uh, COVID um, is this effort with Sylvia Cho and uh, Christine Hunter uh, co-led in our office um, to pull together an expert panel um, to look at um, what we could offer in vaccine communication, applying the behavioral and social sciences to address vaccine hesitancy and foster vaccine confidence. And they put out this report in December on the day that Pfizer uh, released its first um, vaccine. Um, it's been widely used and, and widely um, disseminated um, for people to be able to sort of know sort of what we knew at the time in terms of best approaches. Um, for encouraging uh, vaccination and addressing vaccine hesitancy and concerns. So if you haven't read that or taken a look at it, um, I, I suggest that you do. I think it's a really nice report that was done on a, a rapid basis to be able to give us some sense of that. So next slide. Okay. 
Um, so the other area I wanted to focus on was on firearm injury and mortality prevention has been another area of uh, NIH wide effort. Uh, we've been fortunate that Congress provided 12.5 million each year in 20, uh, FY20 and in FY21 um, to conduct research on firearm injury and mortality work. Um, and you can see here some of that work and, and some of the things that we've done. Next slide is the um, firearm research grants that were funded in FY20. Um, since it was the first of this, um, we focused on some shorter range sort of projects, two-year R61s and some supplement work to begin to, um, again, we almost have to build research capacity in this area again, um, after it had been um, uh, less of a focus in, in, in the more recent years. And then next slide is the FY21 funding um, that's occurred uh, in, back in uh, September um, that we got um, all of these out the door. Again, you can take a closer look at these um, at your leisure, but a sense of sort of, again, the breadth of the type of research um, that the NIH funds um, in firearm violence prevention research, which I've been really pleased to be a part of and, um, and Darren Blackman Demner in our office, as well as a lot of people across the NIH have worked long and hard to make this become a reality. Next slide. Um, I just want to briefly mention, Jim had mentioned them before, the Behavioral and Social Science uh, Council of Councils um, working groups. Um, currently ongoing is the Behavioral and Social Sciences Research Integration effort. Um, and we expect to report out on that in May. Um, Jim had already sort of mentioned that. The other is an um, earlier Council of Councils report that we did looking more at the basic behavioral and social sciences and what could be done in that area. And so um, I wanna um, quickly sort of bring that to your attention. So next slide, because um, that report is already out and there are a number of areas of promising emerging areas, eight of them that the working group identified, including the behavioral, cognitive and social neurosciences and some specific areas within that that could be addressed, a greater focus on epigenetics, on, as I mentioned earlier, the basic functions of sleep and sex. Um, I, not surprisingly, on infectious disease and their related basic behavioral and social processes, which I think we can all agree, we sort of got caught with our pants down a bit um, in this current pandemic and, and not having the level of research in this area in order to be able to be ready and prepared. And um, we'll work hard to ensure that um, we're better prepared should the next pandemic come down the pike um, to have the basic behavioral and social research necessary to understand how people adhere to mitigation procedures, how they respond to vaccine mandates, et cetera, et cetera. All the things are important there. Social interactions and influences on health, which we've already begun to work on, maintaining behavior change, positive health processes, and then a science of science or more meta science approach how we sort of look at open science and recruiting and retention of participants in studies um, and health equity and trust in science and all the various sort of things related to that. Um, I'll also mention two other things ongoing related to this report. So the report is out. Um, we're currently working on transitioning OpNet to a new NIH Institute and Center Director wide executive committee um, that will um, manage sort of trans NIH basic behavioral and social sciences research moving forward. And we also asked a working group of the Behavioral and Social Science Research Coordinating Committee to look through the report and give us um, recommendations on how to think about implementing all the various sort of components of this. Um, and that's ongoing as well. And we should probably hear, hear early next year some of the implementation of that, some of which will go through the sort of new OpNet, and some of it will be from other directions as well, some IC-led efforts also. Next slide. Um, so this is just, and again, this is just to sort of make the note that um, this has been, you know, a, one or just a couple of a number of NIH-wide transdisciplinary research programs that the, that the behavioral and social sciences have been involved in at the NIH. I think we work very hard to ensure that whenever there's an NIH-wide effort that has some relevance to the behavioral and social sciences, that that science gets included in the effort. And these are just examples of many. The most recent one that I'll note is um, the UNITE effort at the NIH um, to address structural racism, not only at the NIH and our own hiring practices, but also in terms of the research that we fund or researchers that we fund, as well as health disparities research and health inequities research that we fund as well. 
Um, so that's a broad-based effort. Um, and again, uh, not surprising to most of you, um, we've been doing um, discrimination, prejudice, um, structural and cultural racism research in the behavioral and social sciences for um, probably half a century now. And there's a lot of research that we can bring to bear on addressing these issues moving forward. Next slide. Um, I, I want to take a, a minute to note the Behavioral and Social Research Coordinating Committee of the NIH. Um, like I said, these are representatives across the NIH um, that help advise OBSSR and um, provide support and input and help us sort of coordinate activities across the NIH and the behavioral and social sciences. And these are only the primary representatives. We have a number of um, project officers from various ICs who are not representatives, but are regularly involved in the effort moving forward. And it's been great to have such a wonderful group of people to work with to help ensure that behavioral and social sciences at the NIH is robust and is accelerated and advances moving forward. Next slide. And then I particularly want to thank those who worked on the festival planning committee. Uh, I, a, special, a special call out to Lisa Dulge, who's um, been the, the lead of this effort for the uh, festival. But you see all the other members who have um, worked on this tirelessly for the last few months to get this all in place and, and make this happen again this year. So many thanks to all of you. Next slide. Um, I also want to note uh, just um, the OBSSR staff so you know who they are and um, the work that they've done. I particularly want to note um, our two new hires for FY21, Kristen Brethel Horowitz, who comes to us from uh, University of Pennsylvania um, and has background in the social neuroscience area and is working among other areas on um, science of science related efforts and open science efforts. And then Beth Jaworski, who recently joined us from the VA. Um, working in the sort of digital health and, and mobile health space. So it's been two um, wonderful additions um, to the office. Next slide. But I also wanted to note um, the people who have been around for a while, these are the, the ones circled in red are the staff who have been around since um, I became the acting director of OBSSR seven years ago before I became the permanent director. Ah, um, and I also want to note, I, I'd forgotten that Sarika uh, Parasuraman is somebody that we also hired in FY21 um, and didn't circle her. So uh, Sarika, sorry about that. So um, that's a, a, another new person. But uh, among the um, existing folks who have been around for a while, these are the folks that, that helped me um, in the transition um, from the prior permanent director to me as acting and then ultimately me as a the next permanent director um, around seven years ago. So it's been great to have those folks around as well to help with that transition. Next slide. So I bring that up because um, this is our current leadership. Um, myself as director, Christine Hunter, who many of you know as deputy director of OBSR, and Wendy Smith is our associate director. And next slide. Um, as Jim noted, as of January 21, Christine Hunter, yay will be the acting director of OBSSR um, and also the acting associate director for behavioral and social sciences research after I retire at the end of December. And I also circle Wendy here because she was actually one of the members of that original cadre of people um, who managed to stick it out through the last transition and, and help me um, in the development of the office and transition um, along the way. So I'm sure she and the others and all of the staff um, will be um, helpful to Christine as she sort of transitions into this new role, which in reality is not that new of a role for her because we, we both have functioned as sort of um, co-directors uh, um, for uh, the years that uh, Christine has been here. So um, and I think it'll be a very smooth transition. Next slide. And then I wanted as a final thing to just say a word about Francis, who's also stepping down as director of the National Institutes of Health. Um, he'll be doing that um, sometime in December, probably toward the latter end of December at this point, but I don't know the exact date. I'm not sure that he knows at this point, um, but, but he'll be stepping down. I just want to say, you know, Francis has been the NIH director for the last 12 years. That's nearly half of the time that OBSSR has been in existence. Um, and if you count um, his time as director of NHGRI, He's been around at the NIH for most of the time that the OBSSR in totality has been in existence. 
Um, he's been a great supporter of the behavioral and social scientists. Sciences, I think when he first came, there was the normal trepidation of, oh no, a geneticist, he won't know anything about social and behavioral sciences. Um, he's been a, a true supporter of our work moving forward, um, was very instrumental in ensuring that um, things like, so a lot of these large scale studies like um, the All of Us Project, um, our work in opioids um, and our work uh, most recently in the COVID-19 pandemic have ensured that they've included a social and behavioral component um, that's substantial and, and reflects the degree to which um, these issues are important. So I think we'll all miss him in this role, but I mentioned that transition because uh, I'm sure a new Institute uh, NIH director will come in and there will be trepidation about her or him as well. Um, and I'll just note that it's a big job that covers a lot of areas and there'll always be um, research that that director needs to get up to speed on. But I know that all of you will help that new director in getting up to speed on what the crucial issues in the behavioral and social sciences are moving forward and ensure that we continue the, the progress we've made to date in that area. So with that, especially since I'm losing my voice after a cold, I will stop. I think I have one more slide just as a thank you. Um, and Dara, I believe you're um, on to moderate, so I'll answer questions if there's still time for that. Great, thank you so much, Bill. Yes, we have a few minutes for questions. And as you can see on the slide here, um, please use the Q&A um, box to submit your questions. Bill, um, thank you for that wonderful overview um, and um, some really um, helpful and inspiring um, <laughs> notes as you um, transition away. Um, the only question we have so far is um, sort of a clarification question. Someone is wondering um, if you could just um, briefly mention what the difference is between the um, FENAX data set and the National COVID Cohort Collaborative or the N3C data set. Oh, the N3C data set. Yeah, yes. yeah. So, um, so, so the N3C has focused primarily on EHR data um, and, the, the, and the data that comes from electronic health records. Um, and, and we've pulled from that and tried to coordinate with them as, as much as possible. But as you know, EHR data really has only a small amount of social and behavioral science data in it um, and doesn't really include much in the way of sort of survey and self-report related instruments. And so we wanted to make sure that there was a place where that work could be um, distributed for other people to be able to see it as well. So N33 knows about us and we know about N3C um, and we've coordinated efforts as much as possible to there. I see them as sort of complementary because they're different types of data sources. Great, thank you. Hmm? Okay, here's a nice, here's a nice question um, to, uh, to get you thinking. Um, what are you most excited about in terms of the future contribution of BSSR for the NIH mission? Are there advances, technical, cultural, et cetera, and how BSSR is actually done that you are particularly excited about for the NIH mission? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think Adam R is probably Adam Russell. So thank you, Adam. <laughs> um, so, because I, I appreciate being teed up on the future vision. Um, I, you know, I, I think there are a number of things that I'm really excited about. I mean, the, the nerd or geeky side of, of my, my own personal research experiences I'm really excited about on uh, the um, digital technologies component of what we're able to do now compared to what we were able to do before. Um, it's not that self-report's not an important component of what we do, but our ability to now essentially virtually directly observe individuals and their behaviors in the context in which they occur and do that in real time, I think is going to change the way we think about um, the influences of behavior um, um, as people sort of change their behavior over time within people. And I think that's, that's been a really critical move forward. And I think it's one that we need to continue to, to nurture as we go along. And the other on the back end of that is the computational modeling and um, AI and ML approaches, um, being able to do um, more sophisticated analyses of um, how we analyze and understand human behavior and animal behavior as well. Um, and actually even to borrow from some of our computational neuroscience colleagues as well. And I guess the other that I would say, because that's related to this is um, 
the integration that we see compared to what it used to be um, is just so much better. Um, we used to have the psychologists over here. I mean, we used to talk about integration and be talking about the psychologist versus the sociologist, right? We now talk about integration in terms of the geneticists working with and the neuro um, science people working together with the social and behavioral scientists in a more integrated team science sort of approach. Um, I think that integration continues to happen, but I think we could accelerate it more. Um, but the ability to put people together from very different backgrounds and experiences um, and different scientific cultures and approaches to be able to tackle difficult questions has been something that has been refreshing to see and I think will continue on. Okay, great. I think that puts us right at um, 1.45 and I think a nice way to end. Um, so thank you again, um, Bill, for your um, great opener. And I am now thrilled to um, turn things over to my colleague, um, Dr. Nadra Tias, who will moderate our first session. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Darren. Thank you so much, um, Bill, for that um, intro. So good afternoon and thank you so much for coming to our first session of the BSSSR Festival. I'm Nadra Tias and I'm very excited to moderate this first panel entitled Toward Cultivating Connection. So I'm really excited that we will explore research and also interventions on loneliness, mental health, and cognitive behavioral therapy. So our first presenter is Dr. Angelina Sutton or Gina. Um, Gina is a professor at the Department of Behavioral Sciences and Social Medicine um, at Florida State University College of Medicine. Gina? Sure. Thank you Any for that you? introduction. <laughs> and I'd like to thank OBSSR for the invitation and opportunity to be a part of the research festival today. I was asked to talk a little bit about the work my lab is doing right now on two pillars of social connection, a sense of purpose in life and loneliness and their association with cognitive health. Next slide, please. So when people are asked what they fear most about getting older, developing Alzheimer's disease or dementia or some cognitive impairment is always high on the list of fears. And this is something of a stereotype of aging, but there is also some truth to it. The Alzheimer's Association estimates that about one in three older adults will die with Alzheimer's disease or related dementia, making it a very prevalent condition at the end of, um, at the end of life. And people with dementia need a lot of care. It's estimated that there are about 11 million Americans providing unpaid care for patients with dementia. And this can um, be a tremendous emotional and financial burden on families and other loved ones. And yet, despite this fear and this prevalence and this burden, people are really optimistic. Next slide, please. When asked whether it is possible to improve or maintain cognitive function with age, more than 90% of people say that yes, it is. And further, when they're asked what are the most important thing, what is the most important thing you can do to maintain your cognition, they say, next slide, please. They say to have a purpose in life. A full 97% of people say that it is either very important or somewhat important to have a purpose in life to maintain cognitive function. Now, these are lay beliefs, and we know that lay beliefs are not always based in reality, but it is also an empirical question. We can ask, to what extent does purpose in life protect cognition as we get older? Next slide, please. And so to address this question, we did a meta-analysis that combined the published literature with some new data analysis that focused on participants who were all cognitively healthy at baseline. They weren't showing any signs of dementia. And we found that for every standard deviation increase in purpose in life, there was about a 30% decreased risk of developing dementia over an up to 17 year follow-up with effects that were robust and replicable across studies. 
indicating that the, there is empirical support for these lay beliefs. Next slide, please. So at this point, you might be wondering what I mean by a sense of purpose in life. The concept, like all good psychological constructs, uh, the concept of purpose in life goes back to ancient civilization and the writings of the ancient Greeks and the ancient Chinese and maybe many other um, ancient cultures. In modern psychology, it is considered an aspect of psychological well being. And it is defined as feeling that one's life is goal oriented and driven and has a sense of direction. Now, there are several reasons why I particularly like this construct. The first is that what gives purpose is personal. So for some people, it's helping others or providing care. For other people, it's creative pursuits. And for others, it might be striving for achievement at school or at work or some combination or other um, activities altogether. But the point is that what, what people derive a sense of purpose from is personal to the individual. And second, it includes little things and everyday activities, as well as those more long-term life goals. And finally, when we measure purpose, we measure a sense of purpose rather than what actually gives purpose. And so in this way, we are not uh, passing judgment on um, activities that are purposeful, but rather assessing a sense that one's life is, um, one's life has purpose. Next slide, please. So there's a lot of information on this slide and I don't expect you to take it all in. Um, but what I do want you to get from it is that a sense of purpose is associated with better outcomes across the spectrum of uh, dementia risk the, from fewer behavioral and clinical risk factors in middle adulthood all the way through to fewer behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia in the last year of life as well as better cognitive, uh, better uh, caregiver outcomes. But to give you an example of, um, of what these associations look like, I wanna talk a little bit about the relation between um, purpose in life and episodic memory, which is a um, common marker of cognitive function. And then going a little bit further down the uh, continuum toward dementia, its relation with motoric cognitive risk syndrome. Next slide, please. So we were interested in addressing the relation between purpose and episodic memory. And to do this, we went through publicly available data sets and identified 37 samples from 32 countries that all included some measure of purpose in life. And importantly, all of these samples also included a standard wordless task to measure episodic memory. That is, participants were asked to retreat, to recall a list of words immediately, and then after a short delay. And across all of these samples, there were nearly 142,000 participants. And what we found was that in 35 of the 37 samples, there was a significant positive association between purpose and episodic memory, indicating that participants who had a greater sense of purpose performed better on this objective measure of memory. Next slide, please. Moving a little bit further down the continuum of dementia risk is motoric cognitive risk syndrome which is defined as the combination of a slower walking speed than what would be expected based on one's age, combined with subjective cognitive complaints about memory, all in the absence of a measured cognitive impairment. So that is among people who are cognitively healthy, having this combination of a slow walking speed and uh, subjective complaints about memory um, this combination is associated with an increased risk of developing dementia. And so we were interested in whether purpose would predict who would develop um, MCR. And so to address this question, we use data from the Health and Retirement Study and the National Health and a Aging Trends Study and selected participants who 
did not have MCR at baseline. And we found in both studies that a greater sense of purpose was protective against developing MCR over this um, over an up to 10 year follow up, indicating that uh, purpose is protective um, early earlier in the uh, continuum toward dementia. Next slide, please. So this research indicates that there is a replicable association between a sense of purpose and uh, cognitive health, uh, better cognitive health outcomes. And then the next question is why? What are the mechanisms that <clears throat> explain why a sense of purpose is related to these better cognitive outcomes? And we have tested a number of behavioral and clinical risk factors and have found that they account for some, but a small amount of the association between sense of purpose and cognitive health. And this indicates that there are likely to be many other uh, factors um, that operate in this pathway. And recently we've been particularly interested in aspects of social health that may um, be mechanisms in this pathway. So now I want to talk a little bit about the work we've been doing, um, looking at these social risk factors and their relation with cognitive health and with the sense of purpose, um, specifically um, our work on loneliness. Uh, next slide, please. So loneliness is defined as the discrepancy between the, um, the social connection that somebody wants versus um, their actual connections. And it's gained a lot of traction in the last decade or so because it has um, been consistently associated with an increased uh, risk of premature, premature mortality in older adulthood. And so we were um, interested in seeing whether this um, association extended to cognitive outcomes. Next slide, please. Um, and specifically risk of dementia. And so we again use the health and retirement study where we selected participants who were cognitively healthy at baseline and who had reported on their feelings of loneliness and then were followed for up to 10 years. Next slide, please. And what we found was that similar to purpose, but in the opposite direction, that greater feelings of loneliness were associated with an increased risk of developing dementia. And that this association, um, that when we included behavioral and clinical risk factors, um, they accounted for some of this association, um, but not much. And further, when we included um, a measure of objective social isolation, we found that both of being objectively socially isolated and the subjective experience of that isolation were both independent predictors of dementia risk. And finally, because we like to, we try to um, build replication into all of the work that we do, we subsequently found that the shared data resource had similar measures um, with cognitive impairment. And we were able to replicate these findings in um, a European context. Next slide, please. So our next step was to evaluate the association between purpose and um, concurrent feelings of loneliness. And to do this, we went back to the uh, publicly available data sets. And here we were able to identify 36 samples that came from 32 countries that all included some measure of purpose and loneliness. And across all of these samples, there were about 135,000 um, participants. And what we found was that in 36 of the 36 samples, there was a significant negative association indicating that a greater sense of purpose was associated with fewer feelings of loneliness when measured concurrently. Next slide, please. Perhaps even more importantly, many of these studies also had longitudinal data available so we were able to examine the development of loneliness um, over time. We identified 30, uh, 28 samples that included, um, that have longitudinal data. And here we selected participants who 
I reported that they did not feel loneliness at the baseline assessment. And then we used purpose to predict who would become lonely over the follow-up. And we found that in 24 of the 28 samples, a greater sense of purpose was protective against developing new feelings of loneliness over follow-ups that range from six weeks to 15 years, indicating that purpose would, uh, helped uh, maintain social integration over time. Next slide, please. So this program of research suggests that a sense of purpose helps to uh, cultivate connection at least in terms of feeling socially connected. And this greater sense of connection, either through greater purpose or less loneliness, helps to support healthier cognitive outcomes. I also wanted to mention that across these studies, we um, always test whether the associations are moderated by sociodemographic characteristics. And we generally find that the interactions um, are not there are few interactions and generally not um, replicable, indicating that these associations um, tend to be similar across age, sex and gender, uh, race, et cetera. And finally, I want to suggest that a sense of purpose may be a promising target for intervent of intervention for healthier cognitive aging, um, both because purpose is a modifiable factor um, and also because it can be intervened on at multiple points along that content continuum toward dementia um, to uh, help support healthier outcomes. Next slide, please. And with that, I would like to thank uh, my collaborators and staff. Without them, um, this work would not get done. And I also want to thank the National Institute on Aging for um, supporting some of the research um, uh, I talked about here and other uh, research that, um, that my lab is currently working on. And with that, I'd be happy to take questions. Gina, thank you so much for that. Um, very, very interesting as um, has been relayed in the um, Q&A. So we do have a couple questions for you. Um, sure. And I'm going to put a few together because I think it um, relays really well with um, some of your take home messages. So um, are purpose and meaning in life synonymous? And if not, how do they differ? And also, what is a measure um, for um, assessing purpose in life? So purpose and, and meaning are similar, but they are not the same thing. Typically, meaning in life is defined as having um, a sense of purpose. So purpose is usually considered one component of meaning, um, but meaning also includes um, a sense that the world is um, organized and uh, coherent. Um, and so actually, when we look at the relation between purpose and meaning and cognitive outcomes, we tend to find whether it's measured as meaning or measured as purpose, the associations tend to be the same, um, but theoretically they are distinguishable um, constructs and that's an important point. Um, in terms of a measure, um, a really common measure is the purpose in life subscale from RIFS um, measures of psychological well-being. Um, we also find that simple measures that just ask uh, to what extent do you feel that your life is purposeful um, are really um, uh, robust uh, predictors of cognitive outcomes. Fabulous, thank you for that. And thank you for the questions. Um, Rick says, thank you. Um, so this is so interesting. Um, another attendee would like to know um, has the sense of purpose been examined in younger populations? And if so, does purpose of life serve as a protective factor in those age groups as well? Yes, so there is a lot of work looking at the development of purpose in adolescence and the transition to young adulthood and um, the uh, how it operates and how protective it is for various outcomes. I will put the disclaimer that I um, tend to study the other side of the lifespan, so I'm not as familiar with that literature, um, but there definitely, it definitely is a very active area of research and um, 
similar to cognitive aging, it purposes associated uh, tends to be associated with better outcomes in young adulthood too. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think um, again from your take home messages, that's what I start to first think about. Is, you know, what about what what can we do um, at a younger age um, to protect you know from um, getting dementia and other related types of um, diseases. So another question. So what sort of interventions increase purpose? Is purpose partially a function of personality? Um, also a good question. It's mm -hmm. certainly related to personality, um, but again, um, not the, the same thing. There has been more work that I'm aware of on interventions for purpose um, in the cancer uh, area um, for cancer survivors, and they tend to focus on things, uh, um, uh, interventions like around um, mindfulness seems to increase purpose. Um, there are kind of life story interventions um, where you know, people reflect on their life, um, where they've been and where they're going um, that seem to be, um, that have been found to increase purpose. Um, you know, in terms of how to increase purpose to support better cognitive outcomes, you know, I think that is a area of research that uh, uh, needs more work in that area. Thank you for that. Um, again, very interested in the intervention aspect of this. So we did receive another question um, about looking at purpose in relation to objective social connection. Um, so, for example, wondering if a stronger sense of purpose, um, are they more likely to foster a social connection or if they're less likely to perceive that they are lonely with fewer social connections, any social connections, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's both. I think that when people feel purposeful, it can be doing a very solitary activity. So you think of like you know, a writer might spend a lot of time alone, but they don't feel lonely because they're really engaged in the work that they're doing. Um, so I think it, like it's both that they, if you're feeling purposeful and you don't feel like you need the social connection, then you have fewer feelings of loneliness. Um, but also there, for a lot of, um, ways that people feel purposeful, that it does involve connecting with other people. And so and there is a uh, fewer, um, uh, you know, people have more social connections, um, uh, you know, feeling purposeful. So I think it works in both directions um, that uh, people, uh, purpose is associated with uh, having more social connections, but among people who don't have a lot of social connections, feeling purposeful um, helps protect against feeling lonely because the what people need to feel connection is derived um, through other activities that don't necessarily need to be with other people. Very cool. Thank you so much for that. Um, so it looks like someone has done this research before, but could Cardison's socio-emotional selectivity theory play a role in purpose of life, um, especially since we are looking at older age groups? Any thought on, do you have any familiarity on that? Well, I'm certainly familiar with Carstensen's theory and there is, I was certainly, um, you know, um, feelings of uh, purpose as kind of a, you know, more positive um orientation towards life in older adulthood um but i don't i am sure people have looked at the connection between them but um you know off the top of my head i would assume that you know people uh tend to feel more purposeful um uh actually i will take that back i am not sure uh what the trajectory is but you know, there is um, you know, an important connection to be made between feeling purposeful and um, uh, um, effective aging. Thank you for that. Um, so I actually had a question around this too. So um, just from um, all of the epidemiological and longitudinal data that you shared, 
Um, so did you find any differences where samples live? So it's, for example, rural versus urban or any other social demographic um, highlights that you could point out in the samples? Yes, thank you for that question. I do have one really interesting provocative finding um, that I think needs to be followed up on. Unfortunately, no, we have not looked at rural versus urban yet. Um, but in the study that we did on purpose and um, episodic memory, we had um, 30 some countries and we tested whether the association was moderated by gross domestic product of the country, so their economic output. Um, and we found that the association was stronger in countries with a lower GDP. And those are countries, those are, that's an economic environment that can be um, more hazardous for cognitive health. And so it looks like purpose helps to, it's even more protective in environments where there um, you know, are more uh, risks to, to cognitive health uh, with age. So, you know, one study, it needs to be um, replicated, um, but provocative and, um, you know, kind of shows how the broader environment may be interacting with uh, psychological processes for cognitive health. Fabulous. Thank you so much for that, Gina. Um, just um, in relation to time, we're going to move forward. But Gina, you do have a few questions, if you don't mind typing answers to those. Um, sure. So thank you to all who provided questions to Gina. Good afternoon. I, for, did you hear my I, intro? For me, did you, I Cesar, did I you hear my intro? Did you hear my introduction or should I do it again? My apologies. <laughs> No, I, I didn't, but I'm sure you, you did a, a, an amazing job. <laughs> All right, well, let me introduce you. Dr. Cesar Escobar Vieira is an assistant professor of psychiatry at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Um, he's one of my grantees, so I'm very excited. Cesar, you have the floor. Thank you. And uh, thank you to uh, OBSSR uh, for the invitation. I feel um, very humble. Uh, of presenting uh, part of the work that we're doing uh, in uh, regards of social media experiences and mental health outcomes with a strong focus on depression for now among uh, LGBTQ people. During the presentation, I will use a lot uh, the acronym SGM, uh, as in sexual and gender minorities, uh, with the caveat that um, uh, the term uh, LGBTQ plus or, um, or similars uh, seem to have a uh, wider uh, acceptance uh, among uh, this uh, group of people. Um, so next slide, please. Those are my disclosures. Uh, next slide, please. We will be discussing uh, some of the background uh, and rational for our work, um, the conceptual framework that uh, uh, guides uh, our work. Uh, some of our initial findings uh, focus specifically on uh, negative social media experiences among LGBTQ uh, uh, or SGM uh, people. And some of the, uh, we think, uh, exciting uh, uh, ongoing and future work. Next slide, please. Next slide. So SGM people are two or three times higher at higher risk of social, uh, going through social isolation and depression than their cisgender heterosexual peers. Depression uh, may also lead to other negative uh, outcomes, uh, such as sexual risk behaviors, suicidality, so and other, uh, yet another uh, negative outcomes. Uh, and there's an even higher risk uh, among SGM persons who are early adolescents, bisexual, transgender, uh, and rural. Next slide, please. So part of these disparities uh, were initially explained with the minority stress theory uh, developed uh, around 2003 uh, by Owen Meyer. 
the foundation of these model uh, uh, explains that there's a, an incongruence between imp the information provided by society on how the world works and the minority person experience of this world. SGM people are likely subjects of these uh, conflicts in the dominant culture, norms, and social structure. Um, um, they do not uh, usually reflect those of the minority. Next slide. However, this model was, like I said, developed around 2003 before uh, we learned about um, social media in, in, in the sense that we do today. And um, since social media appeared, uh, many SGM people turned to it uh, for connecting with others like them, feel part of a community or find support, uh, perceived a lot of times as unavailable in their physical community. Um, Intervention-wide, um, social media and other uh, digital technologies are very acceptable among this group of people as an intervention delivery modality. But on the, on the other hand, social media can also be a, a conduit for rejection, discrimination, discrimination, and other negative experiences, potentially increasing social isolation and depression. And uh, uh, both uh, regarding these experiences and uh, thinking about health uh, interventions, uh, we still have a poor understanding on how social media influence or might influence on health outcomes. Next slide. Part of that, and, and uh, part of that is the fact that that there's just a lot of uh, elements to social media or features or um, components that uh, make our social media experience. That uh, those go from just uh, how long we spend using social media to things that are sometimes more subtle, like uh, what kind of activities we perform on social media, uh, what are our usage patterns, um, are they problematic in the sense that uh, are they potentially addictive, um, which is a construct that is uh, being uh, currently uh, investigated. Uh, are we more of a active or passive social media users and what kind of experiences we have on social media. So all of these potential ways of measuring social media um, uh, also bring um, uh, a lot of challenges in terms of research because uh, which ones are the ones that matter in uh, the potential role of social media on mental health. Um, we know that there's been a lot of research around time, frequency, and number of social media sites that people use. A lot of those findings are mixed, indicating sometimes that uh, more use of social media uh, equates to negative uh, outcomes, and sometimes indicating the contrary. Um, and as more and more longitudinal uh, data appears, and uh, as these data uh, go from self-report to objective measuring uh, of social media use in terms of time, um, those findings are still uh, changing. And uh, a lot of times the findings uh, are non-significant. So for those reasons, uh, over the last uh, couple of years, uh, a lot of research um, or a, a lot of groups have suggested that there might be these other elements, the activities, the usage patterns, the experiences that might be the ones uh, to, to seriously consider. Next slide. So, with that in mind, we wanted to know uh, on the first study that we conducted uh, a couple of years ago, we wanted to know uh, uh, 
we wanted to synthesize the evidence on social media use, how people were measuring it, and, um, and what relation, if anything, if any, with depression or other um, mental health problems among SGM people uh, uh, where uh, there were. And we conducted a systematic review. Uh, we included uh, 11 articles that we were able to identify at the time. Uh, nine, of the, nine of those were uh, quantitative. Uh, um, all of them were uh, self-reported and cross-sectional. And two of them were qualitative, uh, asking people about uh, their experiences on social media. Across the quantitative studies, we found uh, a lot of heterogeneity in how social media use was defined and measured, and um, cyberbullying was uh, the most studied social media experience, a negative mm -hmm. social media experience uh, that was studied and associated with depression and uh, suicidality. The qualitative studies found that while social media provides a space uh, to disclose minority experiences to SGM people and share ways to cope and get support, uh, constant uh, surveillance of one's own social media profile um, can become uh, very quickly an emotional stressor. Next slide. So with uh, that in mind and thinking about uh, minority stress, um, we started thinking about how uh, social media uh, might have a role uh, in among these uh, stressors, uh, looking at the larger picture of minority stress. Next slide. So we um, developed um, quite busy, uh, complicated, maybe, a conceptual framework uh, that, um, that we uh, thought uh, might uh, capture uh, some of the main um, factors related to social media use, experiences, and behavior, and their influence on mental health among SGM people. Um, in this model, uh, we have uh, personal characteristics of SGM persons that may influence their motivation to use uh, and the type of social media uh, user that, uh, that they are. These in turn might influence how uh, SGM people uh, use social media and use social media features. Um, in order to structure their social media experience. For example, uh, the, the composition of their social media network. Um, and the nature of this network may be related to stress uh, when as a minority, uh, as the minority stress model posits, minority status conflicts with the existing social media environment, generating a number of stress processes such as discrimination, bullying, dissemination of stereotypes, expectation of rejection, and, other, uh, and others. The resolution of these processes will largely rely on the mutual influence between uh, these processes and both protective and risk factors associated to the social media experience. Some of these uh, risk and protective factors are included here in the, uh, in the graph. Questions remain on whether the online uh, milieu provides these protective experiences in a way that is as efficacious as the offline uh, medium does. But while negative experiences have been consistently found to increase the likelihood of, say, depression, the role of these over time is uh, much less known. Um, so we thought we needed uh, more longitudinal data uh, among uh, sexual and gender minority people in order to answer these questions. Next slide, please. And um, among the potential uh, candidates of some of these risk factors, we started looking specifically at these uh, negative 
uh, social media experiences. Native social media experiences may include exchanges that uh, make uh, individuals feel sad, depressed, or angry, uh, or viewing content that negatively influences their emotional status. They can be subtle, like having no likes or comments on one's posts, to more severe, like uh, uh, experiencing online victimization. Next slide, please. So we, um, in a second study um, we uh, conducted, we looked at um, qualitative responses that um, were asked in an online cross-sectional survey. Uh, we conducted uh, two years ago. Um, this was a national sample of uh, 2,400 um, U.S. young adults, age uh, 18 to 30, mm -hmm. and about 10 uh, percent of the sample um, identified as a sexual minority, and we had an open-end question asking participants for examples of when social media affected their mental well-being separately in good and bad ways. We coded some and use rate ratios to compare responses of SGM and non-SGM individuals. And then we um, uh, uh, grouped thematically similar codes uh, to, uh, into categories. Most of the responses describe uh, positive uh, effects of social media. However, among the codes that we found, um, uh, of six codes that were significantly more frequent among SGM respondents, only gaining social capital described a positive effect. Uh, the other five remaining codes describe negative effects of social media for uh, SGM users, such as uh, experiencing ne negative emotional contagion, uh, comparing oneself with others, um, experiencing uh, real life repercussions based on social media experiences and the constant need for uh, profile management. These findings suggested us, uh, to us that for SGM persons, gaining social capital from social media is a valuable for establishing and um, maintaining connections but increased negative social media experiences might pose a risk for mental well-being for uh, this group. Next slide. And this is just an example of uh, one of uh, the codes, the, the, the specifically negative codes that we identified in this um, study and the qualitative difference between what a non-SGM participant, an SGM uh, participant uh, um, responded, um, where the SGM participant described actual uh, real life repercussions that happened to them based on uh, being uh, outed, for example, on social media in this particular example. Next slide. And we also wanted to have some more detail about, uh, uh, in addition to uh, having people's um, thoughts and quotes about their experience uh, regarding uh, how these negative social media experiences might actually play a role uh, in the reporting of depressive symptoms. So for this study, the aim was to assess the potential influence of negative social media experiences on the association between SGM uh, identity and depression. And using the same data from the previous study, uh, the same survey data, um, we assessed respondents' uh, SGM identity 
negative social media experiences and depression using the PHQ-9. To assess negative social media experiences, uh, we ask questions uh, like, um, uh, did you experience in the last year things like being called out or hurt by one of your social media contacts? Or have you posted something and received negative feedback? Or uh, have you seen posts or pictures that made you realize you were not uh, invited to a peer's activity or party? We use generalized structural equation modeling to assess both direct and indirect effects uh, of um, negative social media experiences on SGM identity and depression. And we control for a number of uh, demographic uh, variables. Um, we, use, uh, we found that uh, there was a conditional uh, indirect effect of SGM identity on depressive symptoms via negative social media experience. And um, for that for uh, every unit increase in these experiences, uh, there was uh, almost 0.5 unit increase in reporting of uh, depressive symptomology. And these results suggest that uh, higher rates of depression among SGM young adults might be partially explained by negative social media experiences and that reducing these experiences um, might mitigate depressive symptomology in this group. Um, next slide, please. So uh, what are we doing with, with these findings? Well, we, um, as I mentioned before, we thought a lot of, uh, longitudinal data is needed in order to uh, um, better understand this potential association. Because just this, the last study I showed was based on cross-sectional findings, which as, as, as you guys know, have a, a lot of limitations. So next slide, please. So this is part of what we are doing right now. We just started collecting our data uh, last week for this study. And we're conducting a national longitudinal survey on social media use and experiences and mental health among SGM people. Uh, we used uh, exploratory um, sequential, uh, exploratory and explanatory sequential design uh, in order to uh, conduct this study. And we are, uh, conducting um, four uh, data points survey uh, with a national sample of um, SGM young adults recruited online using a number of social media uh, venues. And we, um, they will uh, participate in four different surveys uh, with uh, a frequency of one survey each uh, five weeks. Uh, and we expect that uh, the results of this survey will uh, provide us with um, a lot more uh, data in terms of the longitudinal associations of social media experiences, uh, social media behaviors and activities and a number of mental health outcomes among this particular population. Next slide. Um, however, in the meantime, based on all the qualitative uh, feedback that we already collected, uh, we thought uh, we um, could actually start uh, thinking about potential avenues for intervention and uh, for intervening specifically in reducing these negative social media experiences. And we turned uh, our eyes uh, to uh, one uh, subset of SGM people um, uh, that are uh, SGM uh, uh, adolescents living in, in, in rural areas. And the reason why is because um, uh, in our, uh, in this, uh, another study that we conducted is another systematic review. We found not only that um, 
uh, there is a need for uh, this type of intervention work among SGM uh, uh, people, but we also found that there's literally no uh, intervention developed for uh, the subset of uh, SGM youth uh, that live in rural areas. Next slide. And um, a lot of these uh, uh, youth that live in rural areas, uh, they struggle with uh, social isolation specifically and, um, and defined as the lack of social connections and the lack of uh, resources or um, the perception of uh, being cut off from uh, normal social networks. And um, it can involve uh, social isolation, staying at home for a lengthy period of time, having no access to services uh, or support services uh, or community involvement or little or no communication with friends, uh, family and acquaintances. And because of that, uh, this particular uh, group of SGM youth turned to social media again to connect but uh, face a steep learning curve uh, in dealing with all these new uh, social media uh, experiences and processes. And as I mentioned, there were no strategies to optimize and help uh, this particular group of SGM youth to um, improve their social media experience. Next slide. Cesar, you have one minute left. And, um, and so we started uh, developing this intervention. And I think we can skip this slide. Based on previous work that we uh, 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 conducted with um, uh, a lot of uh, the collaborators uh, that I have uh, the luck to work with. And we focus on develop educational modules, focus on four main areas of social media experience. And uh, we, um, uh, based on feedback that we gained from rural youth, SGM rural, rural youth, we uh, started developing um, a chatbot uh, that currently lives uh, on one of the social media platforms uh, in form of, uh, um, and deliver the content, we deliver the content in form of animated videos, infographics, and fictionalized stories. Next slide. Uh, and this is just uh, uh, some pictures of uh, how uh, the chatbot interacts with uh, the user. Next slide. And these are some of the infographics that uh, we uh, shared with the user during the session. These um, are focused on uh, specifically dealing with the experience of negativity on social media, limit uh, screen time, and uh, engaging uh, with social media, um, uh, seeking to connect with actual allies. Um, and Next slide. And um, this is um, where I'm gonna stop. And um, I just wanna thank uh, uh, a lot of my collaborators and um, uh, that are listed here. And I think there's one more. Thank you. And I'm uh, open to questions. All right, thank you so much. Um, so if you have any questions for Cesar, please do put them in the Q&A. Cesar, I'm going to ask you to write your answers to those questions because we need to move to our next speaker. So thank you so much for sharing um, today about social media um, and the impact that has on um, populations. So our next presenter is Dr. Naomi Simon, um, who is a professor of psychiatry at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine. Naomi, you have the floor. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And I'm really honored to be here for this festival and to get to share to you. I think today we have an interesting 
um, diverse set of presentations. And now we're going to the spectrum of clinical trial research, but still all related to mental health and overlapping, I think, with um, trying to address emotional uh, responses and disorders. So in this case, now we're going to shift and focus on a clinical trial. It's a randomized clinical trial. Next slide, please. Um, that is uh, funded by the NCCIH. We're very grateful to them. This was a, a two-site randomized controlled trial. And then I moved from NTH to NYU, so it became three centers. Um, I myself, my background, I'm a psychiatrist, and my background is in uh, clinical trials with both pharmacotherapies, cognitive behavioral uh, approaches, so more formal sort of protocolized psychotherapies across anxiety disorders, stress, trauma, and grief. But my colleagues uh, reached out to me. So Satvir Khalsa in particular, uh, who you see here in the middle, is a yoga guru who had been developing research in uh, yoga at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. And my collaborator, um, Stefan Hoffman, who is at the top here next to me, who is a CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy psychology expert. And then these are some of my other colleagues. And we put our heads together and realized that many of our patients were going in the community to um, seek yoga classes and finding benefit for anxiety from this. Uh, and this is how we came together to design this trial, because we wondered how yoga, something which was not covered by insurance companies or considered a uh, treatment that we would prescribe in practice for patients with anxiety disorders, how it may be working compared to a standard evidence-based psychotherapy like cognitive behavioral therapy. So we designed this study to have three arms, uh, the third being the stress education, and I'll tell you more about that. But as you can see, the sample size was weighted towards the two active control groups. The primary outcome was at week 12, and then there was a six month follow-up. Next slide, please. I'll tell you a bit more about that. But we decided to focus first on generalized anxiety disorder. So that's a condition that uh, consists of a broad range of persistent worries with associated symptoms like trouble concentrating, uh, irritability, and often patients have somatic symptoms and sometimes develop comorbidity like depression or substance or al other um, alcohol use disorders. And there's a high burden associated with this. And the way that it's diagnosed is patients have to have met the criteria in our DSM for at least six months. So it's a chronic condition. It often onsets early in life. Um, and uh, cognitive behavioral therapy has become the gold standard um, psychological treatment for generalized anxiety, but it's a very specialized intervention that is not always available. And um, even in our cities, like I'm in New York or when I was in Boston, there's a long, long wait lists to get access to this. So uh, we thought in contrast, yoga was something that was available broadly in the community and is very popular. Uh, where it's hard to get people to take the time to go to therapy often. Uh, and in data in 2017 said there were 14% of adults who were already practicing. And there was some data supporting generally the, con the idea that yoga reduces symptoms of anxiety, but it was inconclusive, especially when patients met criteria for full anxiety disorder. So our colleagues did some initial pilot work, which is what uh, kind of drew me into this work, studying a form of yoga called kundalini yoga. This is a safe and popular um, accessible style of yoga that differs somewhat in terms of a little bit more emphasis on breath practice and integrates some meditation, as well as the traditional aspects of yoga. And so uh, their pilot data suggested that it may be effective, which drew our attention to it. Next slide, please. Um, so we developed this study with, um, these are the two core aim, primary aims of the study to examine whether yoga was effective for generalized anxiety disorder. So we wanted a time and attention control given uh, attending a class or an intervention. In this case, it's delivered as a group of four to six individuals in and of itself can have significant effects and benefits for people with anxiety. So we had a time and attention control, which is a stress education class, and then also the cognitive behavioral therapy. So the first aim was to look at the short-term efficacy 
of uh, yoga and CBT compared to the control condition, each of those analyses. Um, and then we also hypothesized that yoga would be non-inferior to cognitive behavioral therapy based on our primary outcome measure, which was a responder status, essentially a clinical rating anchored to the anxiety. And then we also had a six month outcome as um, part of this, a follow-up aim. Next slide, please. The population for this study were adults age 18 and older with a primary diagnosis of generalized anxiety disorder. And you'll notice that we completed the enrollment for this study uh, in 2019. It was just before COVID hit. So this study was not impacted by the pandemic. Um, participants were uh, assigned through uh, you know, one-to-one -one randomization and two-to-one on the, the control group. As I mentioned, most classes were four to six. We had some uh, that were three to six with two instructors. The intervention occurred once a week for two hour sessions over the course of 12 weeks. And the yoga followed a protocol developed by the guru Ram Das at the Center for Medicine and Humanology. And as I mentioned, Dr. Satvir Khalsa oversaw the fidelity of that um, protocol. And we used uh, commonly used in psychiatric outcome research, clinical global impression, but ranked uh, anchored to anxiety improvement. Next slide, please. And just to go through kind of quickly, uh, the inclusion and exclusion to get a sense of who the population were, um, we did require people to have at least moderate or higher symptoms of generalized anxiety as their primary problem they could have other comorbid conditions, but the GAD had to be determined to be primary after a um, uh, intensive kind of um, diagnostic evaluation with a trained evaluator, generally psychologist or a psychiatrist, and they could not be having any changes or new psychotropic medications. They had to be willing to participate in all three arms of the study. Um, and we did assess to assure that people were not, next slide please, um, were not pregnant or planning to become pregnant and that they could understand the protocol. And then we also wanted to make sure that we didn't have anyone who is at acute risk for suicide or having other significant cognitive issues that might interfere with participation. Uh, next slide. Um, and then there were some additional um, comorbid conditions that generally trump the generalized anxiety as primary. So we excluded those like a primary neurocognitive, PTSD, psychotic, bipolar, or developmental disorder. And then we also limited, and actually interestingly, as we recruited over time, uh, we realized we were probably too tight because yoga had become so popular that many patients were um, not meeting our entry criteria because they had had more than five yoga classes that many people were receiving this in school, for example, and that excluded them. So I think if we did this again, we would be a little looser about that. And they couldn't have had CBT or any ongoing psychotherapy um, or significant cognitive impairment. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Yeah, thank you. And this is just to give you a sense of the flow of the patients coming through the study. As often happens, we um, had to screen many individuals to find those who are able to participate. And I would say one of the most challenging things actually in this design is patients had to be available to participate in a group. So that meant that, um, that we had to have three different instructors who were available at different times um, and that the patients had to be willing to be randomized to any of those without a choice in that matter. And interesting, one of the early lessons we learned is we had people come to their assigned class um, for the first time after telling them what the group was. And for the first 46 participants, we had um, drop out in part due to probably um, preferences that people had. So we changed that at uh, patient 46 to not tell them until they arrived and that decreased the amount of dropout. Um, but we still did have some dropout and most of it, if you can see kind of in the center in each group, the highest reason was scheduling or if someone had a change in availability, got a new job, a new course, they might not have been able to attend and we couldn't move. Um, the course just for one person because it was a group intervention. Um, but you can see that, uh, you know, we did have uh, about two thirds who completed the post-treatment assessments, which is the primary 12 week outcome and then the six month follow-ups. I would also um, just mention, I, I uh, dropped out of my slide set accidentally, my um, kind of table one 
but in terms of the demographics of this group uh, of this population, perhaps because of our entry criteria, but we or where the studies were located in academic medical centers, um, we did end up recruiting a very highly educated sample about um, two thirds had been to or really I think 80% had college or higher in terms of educational status their mean age was in the low 30s and about two thirds were women. And it was about 70% Caucasian and about 50% were never married. And then in terms of the comorbidities, which were allowed, we had about 40% who had comorbid social anxiety disorder. And um, depending upon the group, about um, up to approximately 20% who had a second anxiety disorder or depression. And basically two thirds of the sample had at least one of those. Next slide. Um, our primary outcome measure, as I mentioned, was the acute GAD response. So really trying to focus on those anxiety and worry symptoms. We did have secondary outcome measures, but I, uh, not all of those have been analyzed yet. And I, I won't be sharing that with you, but we also had many assessments around um, compliance in the study because part of what we wanted to do in doing this study was to assure that um, we did a really well done tight study uh, uh, and that at the different centers, the treatments were all being delivered with great fidelity. The next slide, please. Um, okay, so for our statistical met met uh, methodology, we analyzed our primary outcome using a generalized linear mixed model with a logistic linking function with a binom binomial outcome distribution. So this is basically an intent to treat analysis to include all people who had at least one data point to increase our power, as well as the generalizability, um, given that there was some dropout. This was a three level model with repeated measurements um, and the growth curve of response over time during the treatment was modeled through this as quadratic because there was a, a fast improvement at the beginning and I'll show you the curve as, in a few minutes, um, which leveled off over time. Uh, and we set a non-inferiority margin of 17%. This is 50% of the expected difference in CBT versus controls in the literature. Next slide, please. Um, so I will go through uh, the different outcomes that we have um, for the hypotheses. And basically what we found, so this is the primary 12-week outcomes, was that Kundalini Yoga response rates were 54%. Uh, and in stress education, it was 33%. And this was significantly higher with an odds ratio of 2.4 and a number needed to treat of about 4.6. Response rates for CBT were also higher, though somewhat higher, as you'll see, 70.8% compared to that 33% in the stress education. Again, significantly higher with an odds rate ratio of five, but a lower number needed to treat of 2.6. Next slide, please. Um, and we also looked at the non-inferiority hypothesis, but we did not find that kund kundalini yoga was as effective as CBT based on what I discussed. Although there was a 16% um, difference, which is less than that preset non-inferiority margin, the 95% uh, confidence interval was broader. So we could not conclude that it was non-inferior. We also uh, found a trend, but not a su significant superiority difference at the acute endpoint for um, yoga, or, which is the KY or CBT. Next slide, please. In our secondary hypotheses, in terms of the six month outcomes, the response rate was 76%, as I mentioned, compared to uh, S the SE. So that was maintained and continued to have a higher response. However, the yoga was not significantly higher than the control group, suggesting that it was not as robust or continuing in effect as the CBT was. Um, and we also could not conclude that yoga was non inferior to CBT at six months. Next slide, please. This is to show you so you can really see a sense of the different arms. Uh, stress education is the blue on the bottom, CBT is on top, and yoga is in the middle. And that's basically what we found that yoga is more effective than a control condition, but it lies somewhere in between the level of effect of cognitive behavioral therapy and the control condition over time. Next slide, please. Also, just to point out a few points about the, the study, the treatments were all very well tolerated, minimal side effects at all. Uh, we had very high 
treatment competence and adherence. We did independent taping and rating by independent raters, 91 to 97%, looking at every class for each intervention. Our inter-rater reliability on those clinical global improvement scores were assessed for a random 19% of TAPE scores. That was also very high. Um, and uh, we also did a bunch of sensitivity analyses to make sure that there wasn't something specific to our analyses. And interestingly, that found that cognitive behavioral therapy was superior to both SE and the yoga, but did not find significant differences. Again, really the, the picture showed it all that yoga was kind of in between here and the CBT was more robust. Next slide, please. So that's the summary of our primary findings that in, with a 12 week intervention, um, Kundalini yoga was well tolerated intervention for adults with GAD. It was um, just as popular as the cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and there were acute response over 12 weeks, although they were not consistent across every measure. Uh, and they did not last as long. So our conclusions are that kundalini yoga can reduce anxiety for adults with generalized anxiety, but cognitive behavioral therapy should remain first line. We do have a number of limitations given uh, what I talked about, like our very rigorous selection criteria, um, you know, some of the limitations of the sociodemographics that we ended up recruiting. Um, and we have not looked at all yoga types, although this is a, uh, overlaps quite a bit with the others. So in the future, we want to increase our understanding of the heterogeneity of response. So for whom is yoga enough? And how can we understand how it's working or why it's working so we can target um, making it available to patients where they'll have the most effect? Um, next slide, please. So this is just to uh, thank again NCCIH for funding this study and for the broad team that it takes, as well as our many students, research assistants, and most of all, our patient participants. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions if there's still time. Thank you so, so much, Naomi. Um, very interesting also. And a question that I had um, also came into the Q and A. So um, when you talk about yoga and you did um, mention the Kundalini yoga, um, so are we just talking about the asanas and postures or does that include meditation too? Yeah. So the Kundalini yoga does include some medit meditative practice with breathing and uh, some mindful awareness. So you may be aware of actually another area of my uh, research at some, that NCCIH, one of my collaborators, funded K Award, and we're now doing um, a new study actually with neuroimaging is mind-body stress reduction, which is fully meditation. So that's like a full course focused on meditation. In yoga, um, the Kundalini yoga version, and again, there are many different versions of yoga, but in that version, um, there's a lot of breath awareness and breathing focus. And then there are also po postures. Um, you know, I think the, uh, we, we emphasize less some, um, the most traditional kind of Kundalini yoga focuses also on these chakras and the body and how you have flow. We didn't really think that we would engage people that well through that. So we include everything else, but it still has all of those postures, um, breathing exercises, patients. I don't think I said, um, did 20 minutes of homework that would include those same kinds of things. So the yoga postures, integrating the breathing and mindful awareness is really the meditative component. Very good, very helpful to have that context. Thank you for that. Uh, another question by one of our um, uh, colleagues here. Um, so are there other mental health diseases or disorders um, that you think yoga could be beneficial for? Yeah, I mean, we picked GED just because it's like a typical classic um, you know, anxiety disorder and it's very common and it involves worry. But many patients, many people, first of all, um, can benefit from yoga if you have anxiety and stress that doesn't meet the level of an anxiety disorder. But um, there's less data, but we, we do believe that it could be helpful for other disorders like panic disorder, social anxiety, and there is some data in depression that um, forms of yoga can be helpful for depression as well. But I think that if you put it all together, there's also growing data for, as we, we talked about the mindfulness and meditation approaches for these conditions. So I think, um, you know, as an NIMH, for example, has started to focus on the RDOC and the cross cutting. So if you think about kind of the mood, stress, anxiety axis, mm -hmm. 
I think that's where it's most effective. And whether it's specifically one disorder or the whole disorder, that's what we're trying to understand if it if it really matters which one. Yeah. Very good. Thank you for that. Um, and our last question. Um, so Naomi, did you um, conduct any sub-analyses um, on the effects of yoga um, based on the different levels of anxiety? Or anxiety have we done symptoms? A we have not done a sub-analysis like that. Do you, do you mean like based on their severity, if it changed? Correct. Or yeah, we have we have not done a sub analysis, but everyone had to have the CGI severity score of at least four, and so they were in the moderate to moderate to severe range. So we didn't uh, include people who were really mild because we really wanted to see in this study if you take, you know, someone who has significant symptoms, like someone you would consider pr potentially prescribing a medication for in practice, is yoga going to make a difference enough for that person or right. for cognitive behavioral. So we picked the higher end of the spectrum to start. Very good. Well, thank you so much for presenting that um, that uh, our well, that clinical trial for us. Very interesting. And thank you to all our presenters for session one. So I think now we have a break. So stay tuned. Thank you. Good afternoon. It is 3.10 p.m. And we are about to start our second panel of the day. It is my delight and privilege to introduce this distinct panel to the NIH Behavioral and Social Sciences Research Festival. If you are eager to learn how cutting edge technology and our eternal necessity to belong work in concert to change the rules of engagement and ultimately transform our life, you are in the right place. The richness of these projects is sure to generate many questions. Please ask them through the Q&A feature of this um, Zoom webinar, and the presenters will have time to address them after each presentation. It has been a very engaged audience so far, so please stay active. Our first speaker is Dr. Diane Cook, a Regent Professor and Hugh Rogers Chair from the School of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at the Washington State University. Dr. Cook will talk about fusing ambient and mobile sensor features into a behavior room for predicting clinical health scores. Diane, please take it away. Thank you for the introduction. My name is Diane Cook and I'm a professor in computer science where I focus on machine learning techniques to model human behavior from sensor data and use that information to predict clinical diagnosis and clinical health measures. The work I'm talking about today is sponsored by NIA and NINR and is done in collaboration with my colleague, Maureen schmitter Edgecombe, who is a professor in neuropsychology. Next slide. We hypothesize that machine learning techniques can be used to model and recognize human behavior from sensor data, and that these digital behavior markers can in turn be mapped onto clinical measures, assisting with this long-term goal of automating health assessment and intervention through technology. In this particular study, we're also looking at whether performance that of the predictive algorithms can be boosted by fusing multiple sources of sensor, sensor information and using the relationships between the clinical measures themselves. So our methods are to perform continuous behavior sensing from multiple types of platforms, in this particular case, smart home ambient sensors and smartwatch mobile sensors. From these data, we extract digital behavior markers and then use machine learning techniques to map those digital behavior markers onto clinical measures. And again, we're interested in seeing how well such behavior markers are predictive of clinical measures and whether these predictive algorithms can be improved by using multiple sources of information 
and joint inference, which utilizes the relationship between the clinical measures themselves. As we add more measures, more health domains, and more sources of information, we are moving in the direction of this long-term goal to build a digital twin or a virtual model of a physical human being that we can use to infer information and automate health assessment and intervention. Next slide, please. In this particular study, we recruited 21 healthy older adults with a mean age of 69, 16 females, five males. The top graph shows the distribution of the sample along the dimensions of race, age, and education. Color shows gender, and size of the dot shows number of pre-existing conditions. This sample of participants wore smartwatches continuously for one month in order to collect longitudinal smartwatch data. And we embedded sensors into their homes for the same month to collect continuous ambient sensor data. We collected 136 clinical measures. Some of them were task-based, some of them were self-report, and some of them were in the moment EMA responses. Of those, we selected seven measures that are our targets that we are trying to predict using machine learning techniques. The graph on the bottom shows a distribution of these participants along these 136 measures using principal component analysis to reduce it down to three spatial dimensions plus color so you could see what the distribution looks like across these measures. But the seven measures that we use for our predictive targets are of interest for us because we are monitoring individuals in their own homes as they age so we can assess changes in cognitive mobility and functional health with a goal of designing technologies to help people, people stay independent as long as possible. So you can see that the constructs that are assessed with these seven target variables get at different aspects of cognitive and functional health, verbal ability, cognitive status, executive function, mobility, and ultimately ability to perform activities independently. Next slide, please. So our first machine learning task is to take a continuous stream of data from these sensors and label the data with corresponding activity names. This is important for us because activity labels give us a vocabulary for expressing the behavioral routine and changes in behavior for an individual. So data comes in a continuous stream. What we do computationally is extract features from a subsequence or chunk of time within that continuous stream. And then the machine learning techniques map those features onto a corresponding activity label from a set of possibilities. Our goal is to be able to model all of a person's activity, not just scripted routines, but what happens in the wild in a person's own setting. And as you can see, this is sensor agnostic, so it can be applied to ambient sensors in a home, wearable sensors on a watch, camera, object sensors, and the difference is, if you go to the next slide, are primarily going to be the type of features that we extract from that stream of sensor data. So in the case of ambient sensors, these are passive infrared motion detectors that are placed on ceilings and homes and magnetic door closure sensors. So the types of features that we extract are the time of day, day of week that corresponds to a particular sensor reading, where the sensor was located, how long has it been since the sensor last generated a reading, because these sensors actually only generate text message whenever there's an internal change in state. That's quite different from information we gather from a mobile phone or smartwatch in which the sensors are sampled at a constant rate and they reflect movement. So you have 3D acceleration and rotation as well as location and we extract statistics that reflect those values over that window of time. At the bottom of each 
column, you see the types of activities that we model using these different types of sensors and have previously tested this in earlier studies. We try to design these in such a way that they generalize to multiple individuals. So the results are similar between homes and watches. We have precision and recall that vary from 0.8 to high 0.9. Uh, using leave one home out or leave one subject out validation. And that's a baseline because we will use these activity labeled data to generate our digital behavior markers. Next slide, please. So to give you a little bit of insight, this is a test bed smart home on our campus where students live as data are collected. And on the ceilings, you will see they look like smoke detectors, but they are the passive infrared motion detectors coupled with sensors that monitor ambient light. As the student opens the door, she's triggering another sensor reading because we also have man magnetic door open close sensors that are coupled with ambient temperature. So anytime there's new heat based movement within a region or the movement stops, Anytime a door opens or shuts, a corresponding text message is sent to a computer that associates the reading with a timestamp and the sensor identifier. And we end up with a text stream like you see in this video that we then analyze, automatically add the activity label and generate behavior markers. Next slide, please. We do the same thing with smartwatches. We want to collect continuous data. So in this study, we gave each participant two watches. They wear one while they charge the other. And then when they lay down to go to sleep, they swap the two. And as you can see, there's continuous movement, 3D acceleration, 3D rotation data being collected during the course of the day. And there's also location data which in theory you can use to track the person on a map, but for privacy reasons, and also because raw locations don't generalize value between people, we extract person-centric features, such as the location type, whether they're in one of their frequented day locations or evening locations, and we put that into the feature vector from which we extract or learn what activity they are currently performing. Next slide, please. So we start with continuous sensor data from multiple types of platforms. We add activity labels using one machine learning algorithm. And then from activity label data, we extract what we will call a behavior own because it's a cataloging or a set of hopefully complete behavior markers. We extract behavior markers for a variety of different time frames. They could be hour, day, or longer, and they correspond to activity levels, but also the time of day that a person is visiting different location types when they're performing these key activities, and their circadian rhythm, how structured their routine looks from one point in time to the next, because this is very important for understanding a person's cognitive and physical health. So our goal then for the final machine learning task is to take this long feature vector of digital behavior markers and map it onto predicted clinical measures. Next slide, please. So we could do that by taking all the information we have about a person, their demographics, the information that they provided about self-report scores, the smart home feature vector, the smart watch feature vector, and use a machine learning algorithm, in this case, a gradient boosting regressor to predict the values for each of our seven target clinical variables. And that would be a very traditional machine learning task, but we take it one step further because we hypothesize that the relationship between the clinical measures can be predictive of each measure. For example, the relationship between mobility and independent function, the relationship between cognitive health and independent function is obvious. So if we can infer the value of one target measure, we can use that inferred value to boost the prediction of another target feature. 
So we do two rounds of inference. In the first, we independently infer the value of each of our target clinical measures. And in the second, we add those inferred values to the feature vector and refine the prediction. So we refer to this as joint inference, this two pass technique. Next slide, please. And this is the results we get from these ideas for this particular study with 21 healthy adults collecting data with smart home and smart watch. The results are reported in terms of correlation coefficient. And the takeaway here is that the different colors indicate what information source was most predictive. So you could be looking at smart home, which is red, smart watch, which is blue, or a fusion of the two. And you could be looking at these independent inferences or this two pass joint technique that I was talking about. And we learned that the more information you have, both between clinical measures and for multiple sensor platforms, the better the predictive performance. Next slide, please. So the talk up until now has been talking about a paper that was published and available. This is now ongoing work that I will touch on briefly because we are interested in adding more information to our digital twin. This is an app that is used as kind of a cognitive prosthesis. It was designed in collaboration with older adults to be a memory aid where an individual can store their to-do list and their personal information and the smart home actually populates the app with tasks that it sends they perform that day. Next slide, please. So what we've done is another new data collection where we capture the behavior data from smart home sensors, but we also capture information from this intervention. So how many times is the intervention used? Can we extract text features when they are journaling within the app and use that to perform joint inference of clinical measures? So this graph shows the distribution for this sample among the different target measures. And the results are on the next slide, please. And once again, we're showing in bold the method that performed best, and it's really distributed between uh, the app usage being the best predictor versus the smart home, which is the bottom row being the best predictor versus some combination of multiple inference, multiple information sources being the best predictor of these clinical variables. Next slide, please. So this is just one glimpse into our long-term goal of using machine learning techniques to model human behavior and connect behavior with other sources of information to perform automated health assessment, going in the direction of building a digital twin. And then our ongoing work is not only to expand on the digital twin, but also to make these machine learning models interpretable so that clinicians can have a better trust and understanding of the machine learning methods that we are building. So final slide. Thank you, and I'm very happy to answer your questions. Fantastic, Diane. You are speaking science fiction with a digital twin and predicting behaviors and predictive models. So one of the questions we have is, um, so you kind of uh, addressed it as the next step, but we have all these exposomes and genomes, and you, you were talking about other um, uh, factors that influence our behaviors, as well as probably the system of beliefs and the current stage of health, uh, they all contribute to the uh, variations in behaviors. How do you plan to integrate it all together? Just very high level would be great. Well, so there are many studies that will connect one of these influencing factors with health. And what we're trying to do is connect them all as in a graph. But we are interested because I'm a computer scientist in what is the best computational structure to model this. So we're looking at things like deep networks and autoencoders as the best way to connect it. But we do feel that connecting more than two sources gives us more insights, predictive information than just looking at a pair at a time. 
This is great. We have a lot of questions here. So how do you deal with privacy for your participants? Privacy is a tough one. And we have some practical steps that we take for the study, but I feel it's an ongoing issue. Uh, obviously, we remove any identifying information, but with the smart watch, that is not enough because location data is very personal. And so we try to replace any person specific information with that feature that can be generalized. And uh, yet it is still possible with really good data mining techniques to infer some sensitive features from the model that we are building. And so on one hand, we're trying to build stronger models, but on the other hand, we're also trying to make sure that you, we cannot recreate the sensitive features from the model. So it, it's an adversarial problem and we do work on both fronts. Yeah, it's a challenging problem of the balance. So data from young people, students, was used to train the digital twin. How well does the model apply to older adults? Uh, it's actually the other way around. We collected data from older adult participants. We have collected younger adult data for studies that are not reported here. And the activity models were built from a diversity of ages as well as demographics. The next question is about the cost of equipment and data collection. Well, the, the smartwatch in this case is an Apple watch. And so we all know those are about $500. Uh, no matter what version you're looking at, always the latest one is $500. In terms of the smart home, uh, these are mostly commercial. We have upgraded them a little bit in, in partnership with the company to have a faster sampling rate. And that's it because these motion detectors are what you would put on your garage for security purposes and they don't have a fast sampling rate. But our kit that we put together costs about $800 per home. Sorry, I got myself on you. Again, more questions about cost. Um, how have you assessed acceptability of such intrusive monitoring among various demographic groups? And if there were any differences? That's a very interesting question. And I, one of my colleagues is a nurse and she did an actual study on that particular topic, looking at the diversity of responses among different demographics. So I'm trying to remember some of the takeaway points. Um, it varies dramatically from one person to another, how they feel about that continuous monitoring in general. In most cases, once we showed them, not only the type of sensor, but also the type of digital data that is being collected, they felt better about it because there was no imagery it, to them was just numbers, but we give them complete authority over, in the smart home case, where we will place sensors and where we won't. So some people don't want them in the bathroom, for example, but down to a person, if they, felt that it would keep them in their own home longer where they have more autonomy and more privacy than they were willing to include this additional source of monitoring. And that was demographic wide. Yeah, a little bit more specific question along the same lines asks about black and indigenous uh, people. Did you try to uh, like, how you address and bias in machine learning algorithms towards BIPOC individuals? That is such a good question. And <laughs> we actually have a proposal that is pending out there to do some data collection with American Indians and with African Americans and in working with groups who frequently interact with these different populations, there's a dramatic difference in terms of their acceptance of this. American Indians are uh, the most difficult. They are very wary of this continual monitoring of their behavior. 
Um, but in terms of the other demographics, it actually has varied from one part of the country to another. The study you have, so there was an earlier question about how well this generalizes from younger adults to older adults. We've had a diversity of ages. We have not had a diversity of demographics because we are inland Northwest. We don't have a lot of diversity here in this small town. It's a very farm area. So yes, I think that bias due to lack of demographic diversity is a, a serious issue. And that's one that we look at in machine learning. We can actually quantify the amount of bias in the learn model that's due to diversity. And we look at ways of improving it with synthetic data. And obviously, ultimately, just by trying to recruit a more diverse population as we are now attempting to do. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I know there are so many different facets to your research. I will ask the last question because we are uh, running towards the end of time. But it is uh, along the uh, both previous streams of questions about the system cost and how do you see the cost being made more attainable for at risk low income folks who might benefit from this technology uh, when it goes public? Well, our hope definitely is that insurance companies will start to cover this and some have an indicated an interest in this, but there needs to be a specific cost benefit trade-off study. And I think that we have the foundation for that, but nobody has actually performed that yet. I, the cost is not exorbitant, but it would be very difficult for people on a fixed income. So we hope that that will be the glue that makes it happen for everybody. Yes, yeah, there is a lot of translation uh, to happen before we see it in every house. But definitely people who know how to work with policymakers can help you in, the, in this endeavor. Thank you very much, Diane. It was fantastic. And there are more questions, but we have to move on to the next presentation. I'll share with you questions so you may be able to answer them later. I Thank would you. appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, so now it's time to move from the power of data to the power of storytelling. The storytelling is an ancient art and science of conveying wisdom through generations. It's been used for centuries. And um, now we bring it into the world of technology. Our next team of presenters consists of Aline Gabrum, Luis Valdez, both are health promotion and policy faculty members at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, along with the Man of Color Health Awareness, abbreviated MOCA, lead facilitator and outreach ambassador Albert Hubert, otherwise known as Brother Al MOCA. Take it away, Aline. Okay, I think uh, Brother Al, are you? Do you want to start? No, you go right ahead. You can do the academics okay. of it, and then I can just okay. move in. Okay. Um, so, welcome to our presentation today. We're talking about participant engagement and ethical digital storytelling, the Mocha Moving Forward project, and this is a project that was funded by the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. Uh, originally, it was a UL one mechanism that shifted into being an R one. Um, in year three, I believe. Next slide. So thank you. This is contribute to Dr. Graham. Dr. Graham is the individual who it was one of the researchers at the University of Massachusetts. Once again, my name is Brother Al, and I'm a lead facilitator for the Men of Color Health Awareness Program here in the Greater Springfield, uh, about 90 miles south of Boston, where is the Basketball Hall of Fame. And Dr. Graham was a great envisioner. He is a great envisioner of, of the program. He came to MOCA and MOCA was developed in say 2011 through the Department of Public Health and with the YMCA. So Dr. Graham came along and he had a vision to enhance the quality of life to individuals in our community. And he wrote this um, story, digital storytelling and he made it plain and he wrote it and we followed it nearby. Um, it's a great 
Um, Digital Story was great to be able to tell men to tell their stories about their health and, and their lifestyle. And it was a great uh, program. Alain, did you want to add anything to that? Or I can just go right on. We can go to the next slide. Next slide. Go ahead, Lynn. Okay. Um, so the study, uh, we're uh, going to provide a little bit of context about how we got to this study and to focusing on digital storytelling. Um, the work we're discussing here is part of a lar of the larger uh, NIH funded study in collaboration with MOCA, Men of Color Health Awareness. Um, so MOCA Moving Forward is a community-based participatory investigation of chronic disease prevention in older, low or no income African-American men. And it has three overarching objectives. The first is to get a better idea of which factors need to be included in a minority stress model to better help us understand the types of stress African-American men are under, how they cope, and how these stress pathways lead to gaps in a variety of health outcomes including a collection of chronic diseases. We're also looking to evaluate the effectiveness of a standard MOCA curriculum that MOCA developed on their own from grassroots um, compared to an experimental narrativized curriculum, which we're talking about more today that Dr. Graham was integral in designing. Um, and this, the narrativizer storytelling based curriculum is based on peer to peer storytelling and um, we're focused on determining the nested factors that have an impact on the stress of African-American men participating in the study. The funding, um, the funded project enlisted African-American men in Springfield in partnership with university researchers to conduct research and on and analyze those issues with the goal of devising strategies to address them. And as part of our formative work to develop a narrative-based curriculum, Stories Matter, we use digital storytelling as a participatory research method to collect data, which would be used to refine the minority stress model and feed into the curriculum. So both stories produced in workshops with participants, as well as some of the story processes were brought into the curriculum. Next slide, please. Should I go? Do you want to go, Brother Al? Oh, okay, the men of color of have witnessed it. This program was designed, like I said, once again, to have a 12 week, three day week, two days of gym workout and, and discussion based on group. Um, it was 15 to 20 men per cohort, ages 35 to 65, holistic approach to health, physical and mental, social and spiritual, um, black masculinity. Uh, the research, also collaboration in 2016 and 21, um, UMass and um, of the School of Public Health and Health uh, Science Department, Health Promotion and Policies and Investigators, um, the Y, the YMCA and the MOCA and the Steering Committee all had a part of this study. Um, I was one of the lead policy investigators on that also. Next slide. Why digital story? I'll go ahead, Elaine. Okay, sure. Yeah. So uh, digital storytelling. Um, uh, one of the reasons that we are interested in digital storytelling is that stories in general co connect events into a sequence that illuminates their significance for the storyteller to motivate action. So it's ripe for use in public health promotion endeavors. Um, stories thus offer the storyteller the opportunity to describe and explain how they make sense of their own decisions and make, make meaning of the relationship between events, actions, and outcomes. So in other words, how they make sense of their health, well-being, and how they plan to move forward. Um, ahead of the NIH-funded study, we I was involved in facilitating a digital storytelling workshop with, I think, about 10 of the, of the men who have graduated from the standard MOCA program known as MOCA Mentors. And that took place in 2013. Um, and based on that work, we knew that MOCA mentors or the leaders of the MOCA movement were really interested in digital storytelling, had really enjoyed that process and showed their, really shared their stories quite often and were really invested in continuing that work. Um, and so they, they, uh, they were originally kind of the, the people who were quite interested in promoting the use of something like digital storytelling in, in adapting their curriculum. So, um, 
in the funded study, the NIH funded study, digital storytelling served three purposes. It was used as a method of formative, formative data collection, as I said, to refine and extend an emergent minority stress model, which was originally um, devised by Dr. Graham. It was used as a method for developing new intervention materials, the so digital stories, I already noted as well, that were incorporated into the adapted Stories Matter curriculum and mostly used for to trigger discussion on a variety of issues and dialogue and discussion. And then third, it was used as an intervention in and of itself where the impact of the workshop on the participants could be assessed by pre-post measures of select psychosocial measures, including stress, optimism, depression, self-esteem, masculinity, social support, and then demographic information. So many of the measures overlapped with, of course, what the MOCA curriculum is focused on addressing. and. Mm -hmm. Importantly, um, Brother Al took part in one of the MOCA, the one of the study workshops, and so was active both ahead of time as a mentor, and then was involved in the uh, workshop process and produced his own story. And we led four digital storytelling work workshops with ten men each, so forty altogether. This was between 2016 and 2017, and I was one of the co-facilitators of the workshop along with a graduate student and Lamont Scott, who is a MOPA Outreach and Community Building Coordinator as well. Next slide, please. So very quickly, um, this, is, this outlines the digital storytelling process that we used in the workshops. And um, there was a survey that took place at the beginning. Importantly, we reviewed the project overview and ethical issues that might arise, knowing also that other ethical issues would arise throughout the project. Um, participants took part in guided talking and writing activities using prompts that I'll discuss in the next slide. And then they took part in what's called a story circle where they've come up with an idea for their story and maybe have written down ideas or have it in their head. And then together they each get a chance to share their story ideas and receive supportive feedback from each other. So it's both kind of a therapeutic type of circle, but also in terms of research, somewhat like a focus group. In the second day, um, the participants finish and record their stories as voiceover recordings. They work on gathering images, and then they learn how to create a rough edit of a video, which means aligning photos with the voiceover. And then in day three, they complete the editing of their stories, and they have an in-workshop screening. Also, another really a, a moment for uh, social support building, solidarity, and also consideration of how the stories might be used by MOCA. Um, and, and furthermore, in terms of data collection, um, also kind of like a focus group to discuss the themes arising in the stories. And then finally, afterward, uh, after this, the workshop's completed, there's a post-survey and workshop evaluation. Um, there may be community and academic screenings of some of the stories uh, which took place. And then furthermore, and really a focus of the grant was incorporating the digital stories and key elements from digital storytelling into the curriculum. Next slide, please. Um, so the prompts that were used in digital storytelling were devised by MOCA mentors and the MOCA steering committee made up of, of men who have gone through the MOCA program and are, are leaders in the program. And so we had two brainstorming sessions among um, MOCA activists, I'd say, and they agreed on nine prompts. We didn't set a limit on prompts prior to the brainstorm, but typically we don't want more than 10 because it's overwhelming. Um, we want the participants to stay focused and not feel overwhelmed. And these prompts fell into larger categories focused on stress related to social networks, identity, structural inequalities, and resilience. In our second brainstorming uh, session, our community partners began telling their own stories during the prompt discussion. So that in and of itself became kind of like a focus group. Um, Begin, they began telling their own stories based on some of the prompts. So we knew these prompts were evocative. They got, you know, they encouraged stories. Um, and some of the men recounted really insightful and moving stories, which is how we knew we were closing in on a final list. And so this is the final list of prompts that we used in the workshop. Um, we, asked, we asked participants to write about, about a moment when, because obviously in something like a digital storytelling workshop, the final video is about one to three minutes long. There's no way someone's gonna tell a story about their whole lives. So we asked to talk about a moment or 
experiences. So write about a moment when you learned what it meant to be a man, you felt like you had to man up or someone expected you to be a man, a meaningful relationship changed the course of your life. You should have been stressed, but you weren't. You felt seen or included or felt overlooked or invisible. You kept quiet or you spoke up. You felt the need to react or not react in an act of everyday racism. You couldn't control something or someone or you felt in control. You felt proud to be a man, a man of color or proud to be yourself. So you can see that the prompts ended up being uh, focused both on difficult, challenging experiences as well as experiences that might have been more joyful or happy or positive. Um, we tried to have a balance of prompts. Next slide, please. So for recruitment and informed consent, which we'll talk a little bit more for ethical issues in a bit, um, at the heart of the recruitment was folks in the MOCA community, the MOCA mentors. And so it's for recruiting, it, uh, especially for the workshops, it wasn't just about flyering, it was about interacting with the community to build and foster rapport before folks came in the door to the workshop. So this meant for facilitators that, um, that participants were coming into the workshop really seemingly like happy to be there and, and feeling supported because there were MOCA mentors there as well. Um, and they were joining in the workshops in order to join the movement in a way. Um, and in terms of compensation for participation, uh, participants received $150 cash for participating in the three days of the workshop, plus snacks and meals and transportation. Um, and we did provide, of course, informed consent, uh, reviewing the study focus at the beginning of the study. Um, and then we uh, provided release of materials at the end after digital stories were produced. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. We also, in the recruitment and screening, um, we conducted a PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder screening, which we'll discuss as well. And we had certain inclusion exclusion criteria. Uh, participants had to be men of color between the ages of 35 and 65 and have lived in and around the area, Springfield area. I think you're up, Luis. I was waiting for the next slide. Hi, folks. Thank you, Alin. Thank you, Brother L. Um, so I'm actually I'm actually gonna insert this a link to this video in the chat, uh, mostly because we've had some trouble playing this uh, in the past, and I wanted to make sure that it like sort of seamless that, that we can seamlessly present. I'm also gonna warn you that I'm 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 I'm, I'm caring for a feverish uh, three year old right now, so I'm in that on my chair, but I'm, I'm gonna try to do as best as we can. Um, Tis life, right? Uh, COVID times. Anyway. Anyway, uh, I, I wanted to I wanted to uh, take an opportunity though, uh, you know, so you can watch the video later to get some more context. But but just a brief description. So um, the video is available in the chat, but it's narrated um, by the storyteller, right? So the story really co covers a very personal experiences um, and highlights reflections about growing up in a traumatic environment, manifest that and how that manifests into violent behavior as a young man. Um, and particularly violence perpetuated toward women. Um, so the, 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 the storyteller then reflects on his position as a man and how he's learned to cope, as well as experiences, uh, his sort of intimate partner violence experiences res have resulted in, in um, uh, 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 experiences with the criminal justice system. And, and then it, a reflection about atoning for his sins, right? So this idea of, of how, this, how these experiences have triggered change in him and how he's now able to reflect it, uh, at, on how um, his life has changed, right? On, on the trajectory that that life has taken him. And so I'll note that, um, you know, there's some, there are some nuances in the video that are really important to sort of pay, pay uh, uh, some attention to. And this idea that, you know, he's speaking from, a, from a, an incredibly vulnerable place, uh, from a really reflective, in a really reflective process about a really sort of a, a, a life uh, with, with, with traumatic experiences, both uh, uh, inflicted upon him and also that he inflicts upon others. And this, and, 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 and this idea of like, how do we get here, right? Um, and and the, the key part here is that, that it is an incredibly vulnerable reflective process and, and that it really does then create the potential for those ethical dilemmas that, that we'll speak to next. Um, so next slide, please. 
The first ethical dilemma stems from the multiple and sort of potentially conflicting objectives that were at play during the digital storytelling process. And so there was a three pronged approach that included first the formative data collection, right? So trying to collect data uh, uh, on, on how this was gonna, you know, how, how to uh, uh, improve upon our understanding of the minority stress process. Um, the second piece was um, the creation sort of uh, trying to create materials for future interventions, right? So these digital stories were supposed to also serve uh, or yield um, sort of materials that were going to be used then to uh, be applied during a, a, a stress and chronic disease uh, reduction and prevention intervention that was spoken about earlier, right? So a larger umbrella grant. Um, and then also uh, uh, the uh, assessing the potential effects on participants due to the participation in digital storytelling process. And so this idea that, that sort of, you know, that, 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 that the objectives pulled the research in multiple directions, some of them which um, had, had larger effects on the men than others, and some of which were, you know, we're, you know, we're trying, we're trying to create knowledge uh, while at the same time paying careful attention to uh, the process and the effects on the process on the participants. Next slide, please. Oh, and, uh, and I'll say that, 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 uh, uh, that that's a particular concern because given the multiple directions that the research can be pulled, the researchers are pulled in, um, there really needs to be careful consideration placed on the process of creating digital storytelling based materials to be used in future intervention efforts. And then also care needs to be taken when straddling these processes with the idea that participants are also having a deeply vulnerable and potentially distressing transformative experience. Um, you know, DST or digital storytelling can be really therapeutic for participants uh, because it helps them sort of process traumatic experiences. But when there's multiple objectives at play, the lines between what's being prioritized, so whether that's the research or the production of materials, or really the, the, the sort of the effect that it has on participants, those lines really blur, um, which, is, which is sort of a, a, a large problem. And it's not necessarily a problem that's just part of digital storytelling. It's a problem of, of, of working in, in, in these community spaces in general. Um, and then this brings me to the second ethical challenge in the page that we're on right now, is um, uh, which was sort of the balance between protecting potential participants from reliving or re-experiencing these traumatic experiences through this process. Um, and then, so, so we have that, and, and, and then also excluding participants based on um, sort of this marginally reliable screening criteria, right? This, this idea that we're screening people for post-traumatic stress disorder, and it's supposed to tell us a little bit about how they're gonna react to, these, to, to, to this process, but that, that we, are, we have doubts about the reliability of this. Um, so it's known that the number of tools that we can rely on to really predict how dis distressful something like this is gonna be um, is limited. So as part of the intake procedure, folks were screened for, for, for PTSD um, prior to the participation. Um, and screening for trauma is really commonly used as, as, as a precaution in, in sort of or a precautionary measure in digital storytelling to protect potential, potential participants um, in this like group-based storytelling process. Um, just in case that it triggers uh, 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 memories uh, of previous traumas. And the dilemma really comes from denying or potentially de denying men the participation um, in the interest of sort of protecting them based on this unreliable PTSD measure. And so that then that creates an opportunity though for folks who are running the workshop, the, the, the folks who have recruited, who have generated this report to really connect at a different level with these potential participants to see how much of that is gonna be, how, um, Sort of to, to triangulate the data, right? So like this is this is the data that we're getting from PTSD from the PTSD measure, and to have a, a broader conversation about whether or not folks are going to be able to handle the process. Um, so I'll say that several participants scored in the moderately high range of the PTSD scale, and in every case, MOCA mentors really consulted with these participants to dive a little deeper on how appropriate their participation was. Um, and it's important to note that in some cases, these participants after the fact reported back on the benefits that they felt that they perceived from the workshops and that, that these final products, these videos that were yielded and these stories that are now sort of like encapsulated in, in, in that space um, were badges of pride and strength and ref the reflexive process and a really great opportunity for their, for, you know, for their processing. Um, next slide, please. And I, I think Galen, you're, you're up next. Yep, thanks. Louise. Um, so uh, a, a third ethical issue that arose in this work um, is the power of shaping. 
And so I, uh, along with a graduate student of mine, uh, we both co-facilitated the workshops. Both of us are white women um, and middle class. And uh, so how did we come into that space, into the workshop space? And it's acknowledged, it was acknowledged from the get-go that facilitators may help shape the narrative to produce stories that will resonate with audiences, inadvertently imposing their own agendas. And sharing power often means losing control over messaging. So this is particularly um, important and actually relates to the fuzzy boundaries uh, that Luis talked about a, a minute ago. And that is um, these stories, this process and the stories were serving multiple purposes. For one, we were investigating using the digital storytelling process to investigate uh, stressors in men's lives and ways that they are experiencing stress and how this might be used, the minority stress model might be used to further adapt the curriculum. Um, we were also interested very much, and Mocha was very interested in men uh, participants producing stories that were really authentic um, in terms of their own personal everyday lived experiences. And what, what ended up happening in some, at some points was that the curriculum, and if you remember the prompts that we reviewed earlier, many of them attempted to uh, encourage storytellers to focus on structural issues like racism, um, like surveillance or policing, um, like uh, uh, lack of uh, jobs and employment or uh, disenfranchisement in the community. Um, however, participants often and mostly wanted to tell personal stories at the individual level and not at the structural level. And so we grappled with how to create a safe space for the men, all men of color to tell their personal stories while also encouraging a focus on structure, structural inequities, how, how that would happen. And, um, and so uh, what ended up happening is that many of the stories were personal in nature. And of course, I'll say as an experienced digital storytelling facilitator and researcher using digital storytelling that the surrounding material around digital stories can always be uh, like contextual material, discussion questions, uh, information provided around the stories can always link back to structural issues. So. That's, that's my comment there. Um, next slide. And uh, we lost ethical issue four, and now we're on to ethical issue five. I, we misnumbered, sorry. Um, so uh, finally uh, is uh, an issue that's really important. I think ethical issue four is about release of materials and these are connected to each other actually. Um, the fifth issue is confidentiality. And these, these two are really pretty closely connected. Um, First of all, stories are sometimes, digital stories are sometimes so distinct, either they have visual material in them that identify um, the storyteller um, or the storyteller wants their name in the story because they produced this material and they want to be acknowledged, uh, credited for their contribution. So the visual and shareable nature of digital stories must be considered. Um, this especially comes to, into play with uh, human subjects and IRB. So IRBs, institutional review boards, can, can sometimes and quite often expect that any published material arising from a digital storytelling workshop or around the digital stories anonymizes participants. While when those stories are shared, either through the curriculum, the Stories Matter curriculum, on a website, through social media, they're not always anonymized, especially because storytellers want credit um, for their knowledge production. So, uh, grappling with that issue is uh, important um, to consider, and actually it's important to instruct our IRBs, our human subjects boards, about this and, and valuing um, a range of knowledge contributions in that respect. Um, in terms of release of materials, um, uh, because the stories, because we can't always guarantee confidentiality in the stories, it's really important that when we're working with storytellers from the beginning, the storytellers know the possible potential uses of the stories. And um, that is even ways that they might use their stories. So one possible use of course was incorporation into the adapted Stories Matter curriculum. One use was in pre presentations, public presentations. One use might be in um, educational settings and advocacy settings. So we carefully list all the possible considerations for release. And we do not ask participants to share, to uh, complete that form until after they have presented uh, after they have completed their digital stories. Last slide, please. 
And finally, uh, we end, we know we're out of time, we end with the Digital Storytellers Bill of Rights that we hand out at the beginning of the workshop, go over point by point with storytellers, and then do remind storytellers about this Digital Storytellers Bill of Rights throughout the workshop. So uh, we hope you'll take a look at this. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was absolutely fantastic. I think it goes back to the Viktor Frankl logotherapy approach <laughs> when <laughs> we change our stories, we change our lives. I think this is fantastic. And we don't have time for questions, but I would like to follow up with you later and see how the power of storytelling, digital storytelling could be combined with the outcomes of the previous presentation, Diane's presentation about data. So thank you so very much. I really appreciate it. This is a fantastic presentation. Thank you and fantastic work. Thank you very much. Thank you. So as Henry Longfellow put it, great is the art of beginning, but, but greater is the art of ending. For the final presentation of this session, I'm thrilled to invite our, uh, to our virtual podium, Dr. Rebecca Schleifer, an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Minnesota Medical School. Dr. Schleifer's community partner at research focuses on the health of justice involved women and children. Take it away, Rebecca. Thank you so much, and thank you for that introduction and the invitation to present today. And you can go ahead to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, I want to start by acknowledging the true experts in this work, and that is the participants and the staff who lead the Minnesota Prison Doula Project. Without this team, uh, this work would just simply not be possible. I also want to acknowledge that I have an incredible team of graduate and undergraduate students who are part of my research team. Two graduate students in particular, Jennifer Saunders and Marianne Howland, each made really significant contributions to the work that I'm presenting today. And finally, my team and I were recently awarded an R01 in March of this year, and I have just an incredible team of colleagues and collaborators from this multi-site study, including researchers and practitioners from six states. And while this work is just getting underway, I'm excited about opportunities to share what we learn as our work unfolds. Next slide. So let's dive in with a very brief overview about what we know about women in prison. Over the past three decades, there has been nearly a 700% increase in the number of women incarcerated in the United States, making this the fastest growing incarcerated population in the country. We also know that many systemic inequities have resulted in marked disparities in who is incarcerated in this country. Women in prison are disproportionately women of color, and we know that they experience very high rates of chronic health conditions and mental health problems. Further, compared to men, women's pathways to incarceration disproportionately include mental health disorders, as well as substance use, trauma, and victimization. Most of the women behind bars are of childbearing age, and the majority are mothers with minor children. We also know that most prisons across the country do not systematically collect anything about pregnant and postpartum people or screen for pregnancy status. So we actually know very little about pregnancy in prison. In her landmark study, Dr. Carolyn Suffren and her colleagues collected data on pregnancy outcomes from all federal prisons and a sample of 22 state prisons and six large jails. From these data, Suffren and her colleagues found that approximately 4% of females entering state prisons were pregnant, resulting in about 3,000 admissions of pregnant people to state prisons each year. So this gives you a bit of a picture about what we know about the numbers. Let's turn now and talk about what we know about the care and treatment of pregnant and postpartum people in prison. Next slide. I'm going to give you the major take home message now, the thing that I'd like you to leave here thinking about from today's presentation. And that is that pregnancy in prison is characterized by a lack of supportive policies and practices. Put simply, prisons weren't built for pregnant and postpartum people. And I believe very strongly that while we can do a lot to improve the conditions of confinement and reduce health inequities among people in this space, these environments will never truly be safe or supportive for pregnant or postpartum people. Next slide. So let's briefly consider prenatal care. First, we know that most jails do not screen for pregnancy status. In their study, Kelsey and colleagues found that about 
40%, only about 40% of jails test all women upon admission, meaning that many people will arrive at prison and find out that they're pregnant for the first time. Additionally, there are no mandatory standards for pregnancy-related care, or and, and the care that has been described has been consistently described as poor. A study from the Bureau of Justice Statistics found that only 54% of pregnant women in prison reported receiving some type of pregnancy-related care while incarcerated. Next slide. In most states, pregnant patients will be transported from their prison to a local hospital for labor and delivery. And in many st states, they will be shackled or restrained during this transportation. In nearly every state, policies prohibit contact with family members. And with the exception of the two armed correctional officers and the nursing and medical staff moving in and out of the room, women will labor and deliver alone. In a few states, Minnesota included, pregnant people have the option of being supported by a birth coach or doula, which I'll share a bit about in a minute. Uh, next slide, please. Patients are generally discharged from the hospital and transported back to prison within 48 to 72 hours. Nearly all biological mothers will be separated from their infants at that point in time, with the exception of mothers in a handful of states where prison nursery programs are available to women who qualify. These transports back to prison are often physically and emotionally traumatic for women. Unclothed body searches and cavity searches are common and women return to prison environments that have given little attention to their postpartum needs. For example, few facilities have any written policies about lactation and postpartum screening is essentially non-existent. This lack of screening is particularly problematic because we know that pregnant and postpartum people in prison have unique health needs and may be more likely to experience mental health difficulties compared to the general prison population, due in part to heightened risks experienced pre-incarceration as well as during incarceration. Next, I want to share some findings from one study that my team and I carried out looking at depressive symptoms among our participants. Next slide. So relatively little is known about depressive symptoms and other mental health symptoms among pregnant and postpartum people in prison. And to our knowledge, no quantitative studies have considered whether aspects of mother-infant separation, including the amount of time that women have to serve after birth, are associated with depressive symptoms. So given the dearth of existing studies, additional research and course on the course of depressive symptoms among this population were, was really needed. Next slide. So we sought to explore this using data from our ongoing community university partnership with the Minnesota Prison Doula Project, which is a prison-based pregnancy support program at our state's only women's prison, the Shakopee Women's Prison. The program consists of a 12-week pregnancy and parenting support group, as well as one-on-one -on -one doula support during pregnancy, labor, birth, and the postpartum period. Doulas aim to conduct at least six one-on-one -on -one visits with each of their clients, and that includes two prenatal visits at the prison, continuous labor and delivery support at the hospital, support during the separation when the mom is discharged from the hospital and the baby goes with an elected caregiver, and to at least two postpartum visits when the, the mom returns to the prison. At each of their visits with the doulas, participants, collected, uh, participants completed a depression screener. Next slide. This study focused on two aims. The first was to advance our understanding of the prevalence of depressive symptoms among pregnant and postpartum women in prison. Second, we sought to identify determinants unique to the carceral setting that may be related to depressive symptoms. Using a prospective longitudinal design, we assessed whether incarceration-related factors were associated with depressive symptoms in a sample of 58 women who gave birth in prison and were separated from their newborn shortly after birth. Next slide. Women self-reported their demographic characteristics and lifetime mental health diagnoses. Here you can see some basic descriptives of the sample, including that 68% of participants reported a previous mental health diagnosis. I also want to note that pregnant women at this prison and in our sample were younger, had fewer years of education, and were more racially and ethnically diverse than their non-pregnant peers at the same prison. Next slide. Here you can see some key statistics on participants' incarceration experiences. So participants had an average sentence length of about 16.8 months, 
sh as shown in the histogram to the right. But there was a really wide range here from three and a half months to about 87 months or about a seven and a half year prison sentence. And on average, participants had spent about 20 weeks incarcerated while pregnant, but again, with a really wide range here from about only four weeks to nearly the entirety of their pregnancy at 37 weeks. Next slide. At prenatal and postpartum doula visits, women completed the patient health questionnaire nine, and this is a reliable and valid measure of depressive symptom severity, which has been used in pregnant and postpartum women in community settings. Participants were asked to rate how often they were bothered by each of nine symptoms over the past two weeks on a zero to three scale with summed scores that could range from zero to 27. Women completed an average of about two PHQ-9s during the pregnancy period and another two PHQ-9s during the postpartum period. And for our analyses, we used three summary measures of depressive symptoms. So we looked at uh, each person's average of all of their pregnancy PHQ scores, the average of all of the available postpartum scores, and the highest PHQ-9 score across all of the visits. Next slide. So what we found is that 34% of our participants had at least one score in the moderate to severe depression range over the course of visits. An additional 33% had at least one score in the mild depression range. Next slide. Results from our study also revealed that the length of time while incarcerated, the length of time incarcerated while pregnant was not associated with pregnancy or postpartum depressive symptoms. Further, remaining sentence length after birth was not associated with average pregnancy depressive symptoms, but was associated with postpartum depressive symptoms. As shown in the scatter plot here, a longer amount of time left to serve after birth was associated with higher average postpartum depressive symptoms. The same pattern of results was seen when remaining sentence length was log transformed to correct the, for the positive skew from the two clients you saw earlier who had very long sentences. These results also held after adjusting for depressive symptoms during pregnancy, racial and ethnic identity, and previous mental health diagnoses. Next slide. So approximately one third of our sample reported depressive symptoms at levels considered indicative of moderate to severe depression during at least one of their visits with their doulas. This rate is approximately twice that of rates reported in studies using the PHQ-9 with pregnant and postpartum women in the community, including in a sample of urban, ethnically diverse, low-income women. So we did not have a comparison group of women who are not receiving the doula intervention. So we can't rule out here the possibility that the prevalence rate in our sample would have been higher in the absence of the intervention. Regardless, our findings provide additional evidence that pregnant and postpartum women in prison are a population at exceptionally high risk for experiencing depressive symptoms. Our data are also novel in that we repeatedly ass assess depressive symptoms over the perinatal period, allowing for more detailed characterization of women's symptoms over time. Next slide. So our findings demonstrate that women in prison who faced longer periods of incarceration after birth reported higher levels of postpartum depressive symptoms. While we did not explicitly measure women's level of distress regarding separation from their newborns, our findings suggest that the duration of the separation is associated with greater emotional distress. Future research should examine whether other aspects of postpartum separation are associated with women's depressive symptoms, things like where the newborn is placed, with a relative or in foster care, and contact with the infant post-birth. Next slide. It will be important for future studies to attempt to replicate our findings. As this sample was small, our study was limited to one prison in the Midwest, and all of the women in our study were receiving pregnancy and postpartum support. Another limitation was that we did not assess mental health symptoms beyond depression. So we encourage future research to expand to include assessment of other mental health symptoms among postpartum, pregnant and postpartum people in prison. Our sample also limited our ability to examine trajectories or delineate profiles of depressive symptoms over time, but this is a valuable area for future inquiry and something that we're looking forward to doing as a team. 
An additional limitation of our sample among women in one Midwestern prison is that we were unable to examine the impact of racial disparities on mental health of women who are pregnant and give birth in prison. Systemic inequities disproportionately place women of color in contact with the criminal legal system, with Black and Native American women disproportionately represented in our state's prison system and across the country. Structural racism and discrimination also contribute to notable disparities in pregnancy and birth outcomes for women of color, including mental health difficulties. So we need to better understand how race, racism, incarceration, and how mental health all interact and as a critical need for future research. Next slide. So our results highlight the need to enhance mental health support for pregnant and postpartum women in prison, including screening and interventions that address mental health symptoms. Additional supportive services such as mental health education and support groups, increased contact with family and friends and doula support may decrease risk for depressive symptoms. So our current R01 includes partners in six states that are implementing some form of enhanced perinatal support programs. And this larger project aims to identify facilitators and barriers in implementing these programs, as well as evaluating the pregnancy and postpartum outcomes of participants, including depressive symptoms. Finally, uh, our results have important implications for policy. State and federal policy changes should focus on preventing the separation of women and their newborns. Most women in our sample were scheduled for release from prison within a year of their infant's birth. Rather than separating women and their newborns during this sensitive developmental period, dyads could be transitioned to community-based alternatives to incarceration. In addition to facilitating mother-infant bonding, these programs can provide parenting education, supportive housing, substance abuse treatment, and mental health counseling. And what is shown here um, on the left of this slide is a recent article about the Minnesota's Healthy Start Act, which was passed earlier this year, using data directly from our Minnesota Prison Doula Project uh, to do just that and identify alternatives to incarceration for pregnant and postpartum women, which we are very, very excited about. So next slide is the last slide, and I will just uh, thank everyone for their time and attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. This is such a fantastic and impactful work, Rebecca. Thank you very much. So we do have some questions. So the first question is, did the intervention and mental health affect birth outcomes among the infants? That's a great question. We have looked at um, some birth outcomes and we have done a number of, actually, we've done some within subjects looking at birth outcomes. In general, we found that our clients um, have few there are few adverse birth outcomes. So most of the babies that are born in our program um, are born full term, few go to the NICU. We have relatively low rates of adverse outcomes around birth outcomes, which is really, really great. It makes it hard uh, to identify intervention effects. We've done two studies that have looked at potential intervention effects. We did um, with the RO3 that I mentioned at the very beginning, we looked at a historical control group um, of pregnant people at the same prison before our prison doula project started. So we looked at um, folks who delivered before 2010, before our intervention started and after 2010. Unfortunately, uh, data quality for the historical control group was incredibly difficult. And we were only able to look at five outcomes, five neonatal outcomes, and we didn't find any significant differences between the historical control and our intervention condition. But we know that those five outcomes that were reliably available in the electronic health record and in the past paper records um, were certainly not all of the things that uh, are important to measure. So that looked at NICU admission, birth weight, gestational age, um, and a couple of other indicators. And we didn't find significant differences there, but um, we're confident that the intervention has implications for um, other aspects of health. Uh, it's feasible, it's acceptable. Um, and so we're looking forward to looking at other ways in which the intervention impacts maternal and child health more broadly. Great. More questions. Uh, what was the breakdown of violent offenders versus minor crimes? Oh, goodness. That is a great question. And 
frankly, not something I spend a lot of time thinking on. We don't restrict the sample um, in any way. Anybody uh, who comes into the facility uh, that is pregnant is eligible for participation in services. And so I truly don't know right offhand the differences in um, offense type. I will say that this particular prison um, has a high number of individuals uh, who are in for um, violent offenses, homicides, uh, many of whom who have uh, been who have killed domestic partners in the context of violent domestic abusive relationships. Um, I think that that was not reflected in our pregnant sample. Many of the clients that are in for our um, that are in and pregnant, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, are in for drug related offenses. And offhand, I, I'm just thinking about the the data that I presented on sentence length. Probably very few of them are in for, for longer person-related or violent offenses, but it's a great question. And the last question probably, what kind of stigma did you encounter on the way of setting up your research and what helped you to overcome it? Oh, that's a great question. I'm I'm not sure that we've totally overcome it. You know, I think the reality is that a lot of time, um, Many people will say they have never thought about this population or that this is a population that they don't think is important or um, why should we care about this? And I think that's something that will constantly be overcoming. Um, I think this, the stigma and shame around incarcerated women is, is really one that is misguided. I think people don't fully understand uh, the context of mass incarceration in this country and the racialized aspect of who goes to prison and for what. And I think that there has been very little attention to this population um, in really in terms of health outcomes. And, and part of what we've tried to do is get folks to think about the next generation, right? We know there are intersecting aspects of marginalization for pregnant and postpartum women in prison and their incarceration runs the risk for health outcomes for the next generation, for the infants and children. And so I think part of that framing has been helpful in getting people to understand um, that these are moms with opportunity. These are moms who have great potential to be wonderful parents who are um, saved for the one or two mistakes that they've made in their lives and uh, deserve to have a second chance. Thank you for that question. Great. Oh, one more question. Yeah. Uh other states working on similar legislation, if you know, using Minnesota as a model. Yeah, there are other states that are certainly looking to us as a model, which is both exciting and a little bit nerve wracking, right? We better get it right. Um, there are the, the five other states that I mentioned that are um, implementing some other form of enhanced perinatal programs um, that ranges from one on one birth support, group based support. Uh, Alabama and Arkansas have fabulous lactation programs. So I think Minnesota has been a model, but we've seen other states cropping up with um, really fabulous fabulous grassroots organizations that are implementing programs and doing some fabulous advocacy work in their states to really um, both improve the care and treatment of pregnant women in prison and um, looking at decarceration efforts and identifying alternatives to incarceration for this population. Thank you so much. I want to give standing ovation to all this panel. Uh, to all the panelists. I think it was fantastic. Thank you very, very much for your work. And now I'm passing the floor to um, the OBSSR Deputy Director, Dr. Christine Hunter. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Um, so I want to start also by thanking the excellent speakers, the Festival Planning Committee, and all of you for joining us virtually today. I hope you found the talks to be as interesting and intellectually stimulating as I did. I also hope you'll join us again tomorrow for the second half of the festival. As you can see from the agenda, we have another exciting day and a full schedule of excellent speakers. And so um, before we close, I hope you will hang in there for a few more minutes, even if we run a little bit long, because before closing the day, we want to take a few minutes to honor Dr. Bill Riley, who, as you heard, is retiring at the end of December. He's the longest serving director of OBSSR. Um, he's really done an outstanding job as the OBSSR director and as the NIH associate director for behavioral and social science research. A part of what has made Bill so successful is how he leads. Um, he is a super smart guy who takes our science and the NIH mission very seriously, but he doesn't take himself too seriously. 
Um, he accomplishes the goals of the job with humor, practicality, and an honest and balanced approach. Um, he's deeply respected across the NIH and beyond, and his service and contribution to the behavioral and social sciences in the NIH mission cannot be understated. Uh, so, Bill, you're going to be very much missed, and we wish you great joy and new adventures in retirement. So, what in what I believe is a surprise, uh, Val should be there to share a gift for you that is a token of appreciation from the behavioral <laughs> and social science community. I don't know if she is there. Yes. yes. <laughs> Hi. Thank you, Val. You're welcome. <laughs> so, and so this is. Do you want me to Go read ahead, what's sorry. on the, the award? Yes, please. That'd be wonderful. Okay. Yes, please. So, this is in recognition and appreciation for incredible leadership as Associate Director for BSSR since 2015 and dedicated service to the NIH community since 2005. Thank you. And thank you, guys. This is really wonderful and very touching. Thank you. And we're not done. So uh, finally, as the, as the last thing we have today, I hope you will all stay logged in to hear a few words for Bill from the NIH director, Dr. Francis Collins. Behavioral and social science research sometimes has a Rodney Dangerfield complex, <laughs> feeling like they don't get no respect all those people with their molecules and their clinical trials and all that stuff. Bill Riley has changed that for all of us, helping us understand just how important and powerful behavioral and social science research can be. And we've certainly learned that more than ever during the COVID pandemic. So it's gonna be hard to say goodbye to Bill. He's done so much for us in these seven years helping to lead the Precision Medicine Initiative, doing a lot about the Promise uh, initiatives, and now playing a really critical role in COVID, including our efforts on testing. But he's been putting in a lot of time over these years, and so he deserves a chance uh, to figure out how to do something else at the end of this year, but we're really gonna miss him. And I think he's converted all of us to being fans of behavioral and social science research and fans of Bill. You could even say we are Billophiles. And so, a little song here, contributed especially by Carrie Wallinetz, who even though she happens to be detailed to the White House, is still willing to come up with lyrics when requested, especially for somebody she also cares a lot about, uh, Bill Riley. And so with apologies to the Wizard of Oz, because we seem to have stolen their tune here, a little tune about Bill. We could reduce the risk of cancer. Social science holds the answer to learn how we behave. Disparities would plummet. We could reach a new health summit if only Bill would stay. Bill taught me that genomics by itself alone is not enough to save the day. With the science of behaving, many more lives will be saving if only Bill would stay. Oh, this guy shaped BMI when it was still brand new. We've got death index data cause of you, Bill. You can't be a really through. We could knock down mental stress, help those who are depressed. Social science leads the way. We could double down on promise and fund health economics if only Bill would stay. Though so I too must say goodbye, let me say, Bill, thank you. NIH owes a debt to you. You have changed our point of view. It's hard to say farewell to someone who's been swell. But thanks for your smile. You got the best smile. 
Though we wish you all the best, Bill, we hope that you won't rest, Bill, till we've solved clinical trials. Well, maybe that's a little too much. Yes, we wish you all the best, Bill, and we hope you'll get some rest, Bill. We are all now Billophiles. So true. Bill, you're very much appreciated. Thank you so much uh, for all of your service. And you're, you're not gone yet, so... <laughs> I'm very grateful for that, and we hope all of you will join us again tomorrow for a very exciting uh, second day of the festival. Thank you.